I was just kidding. <laughs> Congresswoman, this is an audience with a sense of humor. Yeah. Our son Ben, when he was in the third grade, uh, gave advice to his fellow third graders at uh, Brandywood Elementary School, the home of the Bumblebees, uh, just uh, north in Newcastle County. And his advice to them was humor is everything. People say, where did he get that? And I'm not sure, but uh, humor is, you, just, you, you can never have too much of it, even in the midst of all the Challenges we face uh, here at home and around the world, uh, there's, uh, there's reason to be optimistic. I like to quote uh, Albert Einstein, who used to say, in adversity lies opportunity. In adversity lies opportunity. Albert Einstein was a professor at Princeton, uh, about halfway between here and New York City. And he used to take the train a lot uh, out of Princeton. And uh, one day he got on the train and uh, he's looking for his um, for his ticket and he looked in his coat he looked in his pants he looked in his shirt he looked in his briefcase he couldn't find his ticket and uh, he uh, the conductor comes along and albert einstein's pretty anxious and the conductor said mr dr einstein we know you we know who you are we know you ride the train a lot so don't worry about it. you're you're okay and then he walks away the conductor walks away starts to go into the next car and as he's just before he goes in the next car he looks back into the car and he sees uh, dr einstein down on his hands and knees looking for his train ticket. And the conductor rushes back there. He says, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't do this. Don't you ride a train all the time. We know who you are. We know who you are. And Dr. Einstein looked up from his hands and knees and he says, young man, I know who I am too. I just don't know where I'm supposed to go. We're going to talk a little bit about today about uh, where we need to go where we need to go. I'm delighted to be joined here by Lisa Blunt to Rochester, who serves our state in so many different uh, capacities. And we're delighted to be joined here by our leaders, uh, leadership from uh, the uh, uh, Army uh, Corps of Engineers. Um, I'm a retired Navy captain. I always say when, uh, when I'm around people in the Army, uh, different uniforms, but the same uh, same team. And uh, here in this, I'll just, I'll just get this off my chest. We love the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, you and the folks that you lead have helped our state in so many ways, continue to help our state in so many ways from the Maryland line all the way up to Pennsylvania. And uh, we probably don't say thank you enough. We try to, but uh, thank you for all that uh, you and your folks uh, do for us, do with us. And thank you for joining us here to, uh, t today. I have a uh, about a two hour statement that uh, I will open with, and we'll have lunch. It won't seem like two hours, but <laughs> uh, but it, it's a lot shorter, I can assure you. But uh, I, I, I bought this gavel, and if I don't use it, my staff will kill me. There you go. And if people nod off, I'm going to use it again. <laughs> I see you in the in the audience. We're joined by my former colleague, Mary Landrew. Senator Lent Mary, stand up. Let's give Mary a nice round of applause. Her husband, Ernest Frank. Mary, Mary like me is a former state treasurer, and she and I served together uh, pretty good partners for any number of years in the, in the Senate. And delighted to see both of you here uh, to, uh, to today. Um, the letter C figures prominently in the uh, history of our state. The letter C figures prominently in the history of our state. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, colonists came from all over the world and from the Netherlands, the Dutch, we had the Swedes, the, uh, the Fens, just pe all people came from all over the world to, to, uh, to settle uh, Delaware and to settle uh, this, uh, this country. But the letter, uh, see uh, colonists, we, uh, a lot of them uh, raised uh, corn. And uh, as time would go by, a lot of them would raise chickens, which would eat the corn. Uh, over 100 years ago, we changed uh, our constitution and in order to make Delaware an attractive place for companies to incorporate. And today, I, I think there are more four, four, Fortune 500 companies in, uh, incorporated in the state of Delaware than any state uh, uh, in the, uh, the country. So corporations is a big deal. Um, Constitution, we were the first state to ratify the Constitution about 70, 80 miles up the road in Dover, 
uh, 25 white guys gathered at the Golden Fleece Tavern for two or three days, drank a lot of milk, reviewed the, uh, reviewed the, uh, the document that had been sent down from Philadelphia and after three days of debate ratified it unanimously. So we became the, the first state. Uh, cars, there's a time not that long ago where we built more cars. Uh, we had the huge plant, as Lisa remembers, as our Lieutenant Governor remembers, the huge uh, plant, Chrysler plant in Newark, and a huge uh, GM plant in uh, near uh, Newport, Delaware. And uh, so we built, uh, we're famous for our cards, credit cards. If you have, if, look, raise your hands if you have a credit card in your pocket, on your body, in your purse, your, if you have a credit card, there's about a 60% chance that it was issued from a, uh, a bank in Delaware. And for those of you who don't always promptly pay your fees, thank you. You are forgiven and encouraged. <laughs> uh, a lot of companies here, a lot of companies here over the years, and a lot of them are mom and pops, but some of them are pretty big. Uh, the DuPont company is just one of those that are really big. We have some of the biggest banks and corporations really around around the world, and big big companies like AstraZeneca, call uh, Delaware their their uh, American home home headquarters. We have uh, also uh, leaders like Carney. John Carney, our governor, like Castle, who is our governor and our congressman, like Carper. <laughs> and, the, and then we have like LBR, Lisa Blunt, Rochester. We have Kim Coons, Coons yeah. Rochester Center. And uh, we have LBR, no C there. <laughs> but uh, somebody said to me one, one time, maybe no C, but a really cool congresswoman. There you go. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, and we have coasts. Uh, we have a big coast here for a little state. And we have um, a lot of five-star beaches. Uh, last time I checked, we had more five-star beaches than any state in, uh, in America, something we're really proud of. And one of them is named after our Lieutenant Governor, Bethany Hall. Bethany. <laughs> uh, nice round of applause, Bethany. And um, uh, we have a couple of other seas that are more troublesome. And one of those is climate change. It's not something I thought a, a whole lot about when I used to come here as a, a, a guy in, in graduate school right out of the Navy. Didn't think a lot about uh, climate change at the time. Just thought about having a good time. And uh, we uh, certainly did. I uh, made my decision to run for state treasurer at the age of 29, just a few miles off the road from here on a beach, a dollar beach just up the road. My wife and I, for many years, have come to Bethany Beach with our sons when they were younger, and they're just little, they're little guys. And we actually made a decision, a family decision, for me to run for governor right, uh, right here in, in Bethany Beach, out at Bethany West, where we rented a, a house. So um, this place has a special meaning for, for me and for our, 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 our family. And the, the other C I want to mention is the core. The Army Corps of Engineers. I'm uh, privileged to serve uh, as a chairman of the committee on called Environment and Public Works. We have jurisdiction over roads, highways, bridges, uh, climate change, clean air, clean water, uh, wa water, drinking water, wastewater, sanitation, flooding, whole lot. And uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is uh, really a part of our uh, entities that, uh, that we oversee, and it's really a source of joy, just a source of joy. Um, I, that's, that was an ad lib, that was a riff. And now I, now I have to get even more serious. And because uh, the series, the business before us is, is, is serious. And um, we're here today to discuss two uh, immensely important and related topics, climate change and coastal restoration. Having uh, this discussion in the communities that directly feel the impacts of climate change uh, bring new perspectives and a greater sense of urgency to our work. So to everyone who has traveled to Bethany Beach, whether you live around here or you've come from another state uh, or upstate, uh, we're happy that you have, and uh, we want to welcome you uh, warmly. I'm thrilled that uh, Lisa's here, a congresswoman, and uh, we've partnered on so many things uh, in the past, and happy to be delighted to be partnering with you today. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is a principal steward of our nation's water infrastructure. 
Uh, the Corps plays a critical role in the construction and maintenance of much of the infrastructure we see around us in Delaware, such as our port of Wilmington, our wetlands, our marshes, and our beaches. Port of Wilmington is being expanded uh, to the north, basically doubled in size, doubled in employment, expect another couple of thousand people to be working there in a few years. And none of that would happen without the, the help of the Army Corps of Engineers, so we're grateful for, for that. If you had a banana with your breakfast today, any player on the East Coast, that banana came through the Port of Wilmington. We are the top banana port on the East Coast. Corps is also responsible for operating America's water highway, a 12,000 mile long system of inland waterways that are vital, vital to domestic and international commerce. Each year, this expansive system moves more than 500 million tons of commodities. 500 million tons of commodities. The, uh, that includes 60% of our nation's agricultural exports. And the Corps' action to operate and maintain this system results in an economic benefit of nearly $14 billion each year, $14 billion each year in economic benefits. Um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs, actually. Good paying, as Joe Biden would say, good paying union jobs. He'd probably want to work that in. The Corps is also tasked with protecting our communities and our infrastructure from floods and from coastal storms. In 2020 alone, these efforts amounted to more than $250 billion in damage prevention and damage reduction. And that's not all. As we've seen in Delaware and across our nation, when these uh, ecosystems are protected by the core, communities are protected and important wildlife habitat is conserved. These restoration activities also drive tourism and ecotourism economies. For example, people travel from all over to enjoy our beaches and observe our beloved horseshoe crabs and our migratory birds. In the United States, more than 128 million people, this is a great stat, in the United States, there are more than 128 million people who live in coastal counties. That represents more than 40% of our nation's population. Get this, if America's coastal counties were their own nation, just imagine all, uh, all, the, co all the counties on the coast were their own nation, uh, their gross domestic product would rank third in the world, exceeded only by China and by uh, the U.S. as a whole. Unfortunately, today these population centers, these engines of our economy, face uh, a growing unrelenting threat from climate change and many times do not compete and do not compete well for federal assistance due to antiquated budgeting procedures. Since uh, 1901, global sea levels have risen by nearly 10 inches. Well, that may not sound like much, but it is. And uh, the uh, story gets uh, worse because in the, uh, the days uh, to come, the years to come, uh, we're going to really this uh, not just 10 inches of a sea level rise, but a whole lot more. A recent report released uh, actually earlier this month by NOAA, not NOAA, the flood, uh, <laughs> no, the ark, but NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. They released a, a, a report that got a lot of attention, and it's going to continue to get a lot of attention. And they, they project with respect to sea level rises that it's going to uh, accelerate in the next uh, 30 years unless we intervene. The report explains that the United States will experience a profound increase in the frequency of coastal flooding, even in the absence of storms or heavy rainfall. The signs are clear. We must make our infrastructure both more resilient and more nature-based to withstand our changing climate. And while we simultaneously address the root cause of climate change, too much carbon dioxide in, the, in our atmosphere, trapping emissions from all sorts of places, our cars, our trucks, our vans, our power plants, our manufacturing facilities. In Delaware, we've demonstrated that we can protect communities and the environment while also growing our economy. It's not a Hobson's choice. We can do both, and we need to do both. But the continued threats from climate change are threatening this balancing act. The same could be said for Louisiana. Uh, on any given day, Louisiana loses, get this, a foot ball field size piece of wetlands to the sea every 100 minutes. Think about that. Think about a football field every 100 minutes. That's that, that piece of land is gone to the sea. 
that, uh, if you add that up since uh, 1930, it's an area the size of uh, Delaware. So it's huge, huge. And it's going uh, larger and more quickly. Think about it. Uh, these uh, losses will only speed up if we fail to respond and take the action that's, uh, that's called for. Uh, the science is clear. The science is clear. One of my favorite songs by Thomas Dolby, a one-hit wonder, where she blinded me with science. And uh, we don't want to be blinded with science. We want to be guided by science, guided by science. And the science is clear. We must attack this crisis on all fronts, addressing both the root causes of climate change while also repairing the damage that we've already experienced. The latter is where the Army Corps of Engineers plays a vital role. Despite the Corps' historical um, effectiveness of managing flood and coastal uh, storm damages, the growing threat of climate change do not demands that this agency adapt to better protect our, our coasts. And to help the agency to do so, Congress needs to give the Corps the proper budget and necessary authorities. Last uh, year, in fact, last fall, not that many months ago, President Biden signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act into law, which uh, was, I had the privilege to help write and to manage on the floor. It came out of, a large part of it came out of uh, my committee that I'm privileged to, uh, to chair. This law combined with the expected annual appropriations and supplemental spending are expected to provide the Army Corps of Engineers with an additional $100 billion to spend over the next five years. I'll be honest with you, that's a lot of money. It's probably not enough money to meet all the requirements and all the challenges that are facing them, but it's a huge amount of money compared to what we've provided them in, in the past. This historic investment will allow the Corps to begin to clear its deck of backlog projects across our country and free up additional funds that must be used to address key initiatives in our battle against climate change. To incentivize, uh, to rather to increase the, the, the focus of the, the Army Corps' mission around climate change, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy, and Congressman Graves from Louisiana. What's his first name? Do you know? Congressman Graves, what is it? Is Garrett? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I have introduced legislation known as the Shoreline Health Oversight Restoration Resilience and Enhancement Act. Try to put that on a bumper sticker. Right? Yeah. But uh, fortunately, it was an acronym as there is in most cases. And this one is the word shore. The word shore with two R's, two R's. I didn't do that well in spelling. If enacted, the Shore Act will empower the, uh, the Corps to protect our nation's coast from the effect of climate change. And our bill does this by elevating coastal restoration to a primary mission of the agency and promoting the development of sustainable nature-based resilience projects. Our legislation also facilitates the Corps' work with state and local partners in climate mitigation and ecosystem restoration projects. We look forward to discussing the Shore Act with our colleagues in Congress and working to include it as part of our uh, biannual water infrastructure legislation that the Congress will take up uh, this year. We take up Water Resources Development Act every two years and we pass it with huge bipartisan uh, mar margins. And we'll be uh, hopefully taking that up on the floor later this year and um, and I hope we get the same uh, strong response and support. And part of that, we hope, will be the, the shore legislation that I just talked about. Uh, and that leads us to today's hearing. Uh, we'll soon uh, hear from a, a diverse panel of witnesses, wonderful witnesses, including uh, two highly regarded coastal governors, our own governor and governor of Louisiana, senior Army Corps uh, officials and stakeholders who are deeply invested in the health and resiliency of our nation's coasts. And we are grateful to each of you for your presence and really for your leadership uh, and eager to hear from this panel and others that will follow us as we discuss the critical intersection of climate change with our coasts and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now a few introductions. First, Major General William Butch Graham proud Panther graduate of the University of Pittsburgh. He was Army ROTC there. I was Navy ROTC there. Uh, not there, but in, uh, not far away in Ohio State. But uh, we're, uh, he's the uh, current Deputy Commanding General for Civil 
and emergency operation at Headquarters U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. If that sounds like a big job and a big deal, it is. He has a huge, huge uh, job and, 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 and challenge. There he oversees all the Corps' civil works activities along with the $7 billion annual program and responses to storms and other uh, annual, uh, other natural disasters. His previous Corps assignments included a commander of the Corps, uh, the Corps' North Atlantic Division in Pittsburgh District. He's literally served our nation all over the world, and we're grateful for that and honored by his presence today. General Graham is no stranger to Delaware. He's many times received parking tickets here in Bethany Beach. Never been towed, never been. No, he's not received any parking tickets until today. <laughs> and I'm sure we can get it written off if you do. Well, we, the nice thing about so this time of year is there's no parking meters. This is just great. I love it. Love being at the beach in the winter. But anyway, we're grateful uh, for his support and assistance in that of the men and women that he leads. And General Graham, uh, you are now recognized uh, to make your statement. Welcome and thank you. Chairman Carper, Representative Blunt Rochester, I'm certainly honored to testify before you today and, and thank you for this opportunity to discuss the important topics of shoreline and riverbank restoration and resilience. The Corps, as you said, sir, has a primary responsibility for the planning and construction of flood and coastal storm risk management systems along our nation's shorelines and rivers. Coastal storm risk management project that includes Bethany Beach and South Bethany provides critical protection from severe Atlantic storms and rising sea levels all along the, the Delaware coast. Incorporating natural and nature-based features such as sand-filled beaches and dunes, and certainly appreciate the, the, the photographs that the, the team has assembled in front of us. This project provide, provided vital protection during, during Hurricane Sandy in October of 2012, as well as during several nor'easters experienced in recent years. Project features incurred damages due to those significant coastal storms, uh, public and private property located landward where we are of the project received relatively little damage. The Corps and its partners have been able to reconstruct these project features after these events, demonstrating an ability to prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt to the continuing threat of coastal storms and center where I'd say climate change as well. This is the very definition of resiliency. Delaware resiliency. Looking regionally, examples broadly such as this uh, clearly demonstrate the need for a, a more coordinated and resilient systems-based approach to flood and coastal storm risk management. Also in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, Congress provided significant authorities and appropriations to conduct a comprehensive study along the North Atlantic coastline. This effort, called the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, highlighted the long-term challenges from coastal storms facing this part of the nation. It underscored the need to support resilient communities and center, as you mentioned, the ecosystems there as well. While still promoting equity and encouraging economic growth, the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study emphasized a need to transition, where possible, from traditional structural measures, gray infrastructure, to non-structural, natural, and nature-based systems green infrastructure. Further, given projected sea level and climate change trends that were mentioned earlier, the report concluded that further investments and development in science and engineering to include research and development is critical to ensure that the Corps continue to provide sound storm risk reduction solutions. This broad regional study identified nine high-risk focus areas for more in-depth investigation. The City of Norfolk's Coastal Storm Risk Management Study was one of those focus areas. The Norfolk study was undertaken to evaluate risk management solutions for a major city that is predicted to be heavily influenced by rising sea levels. Approved in the Water Resources Development Act of 2020 and initially funded for construction through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, this recommended project includes four storm surge barriers as well as numerous non-structural features such as flood proofing, and building elevations. Additionally, the plan includes construction of oyster reefs and living shorelines to increase resiliency via the incorporation of natural and nature-based features. 
And Senator, when I leave this hearing today, I'll travel down to Norfolk to link up with Mr. Connor, our Assistant Secretary for, for the Army for Civil Works uh, to tour this very project. Give my best, thank you. Will do, Senator. Across the country. Norfolk is where the USS Delaware was built. Most modern, fastest tactical submarine in the world, which comes to Delaware, Port of Wilmington on May, 8th, March 30th, March 31st. Be there. Sorry, that was a <laughs> commercial. It's hard to hit the high <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> Senator, across the country, new and ongoing port planning efforts continue to build upon the lessons learned in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. The recently completed Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Study, another one of these large regional studies, has employed a similarly comprehensive regional approach. The recommended plan includes a combination of aquatic ecosystem restoration and coastal storm risk management features that function as a system to reduce the risk of coastal storm damage to natural areas and man-made infrastructure. Looking nationally, the Corps continues to look ahead at the changing landscape of risk reduction and anticipates delivering a large nationwide study known as the National Shoreline Management Study by the end of this year. The National Shoreline Management Study, which is near and dear to, I'm sure, a lot of people's uh, equities in this room here today, builds on a series of eight regional assessments that explore shoreline erosion and accretion characteristics, certainly a subject that's near and dear to the state of Delaware. These assessments included extensive stakeholder and tribal engagements to make sure that our recommendations are in line with the changing climate. So moving forward, as outlined in our climate action plan, the Corps is committed to evolving our procedures, our planning efforts, and project operations to bolster adaptation and increase resilience to the impacts of climate change. In doing so, the Corps seeks to develop opportunities to enhance the effectiveness of our civil works project and reduce risks to vulnerable communities. Chairman, thank you. And thank you, Representative Blunt Rochester, for providing us the opportunity to testify here today. And I look forward to answering any of your questions. Good. Thank, thank you very much, uh, General. The um, second witness is uh, Brigadier General uh, Jason E. What does the E stand for? Eric, sir. All right. Um, uh, General uh, Kelly. Commanding General for the South Atlantic Division of the Army Corps of Engineers. General Colley, I uh, did not go to the Naval Academy. Where did you go to school? Was that, was that West by God Point? Chairman, I'm a proud graduate of the United States Military Academy yeah, at West Point. Well, we're, maybe salute you. <laughs> uh, General Kelly is responsible for 25,000 square mile area, which includes all or part of eight southern states, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands. General Kelly comes to us with a different perspective that given the destructive hurricanes that uh, settled over Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands and wreaked such havoc will be critical as we work on these policies. General Kelly, uh, we're delighted that you're here. Thanks for bringing the general with you and uh, you're uh, recognized to give us uh, your statement. Thank you. Chairman Carper, Representative Blunt Rochester, I'm honored to testify before you today and, and greatly appreciate the time you've allocated for me to present features of the United States Army Corps of Engineers South Atlantic Division Civil Works Program. I welcome the opportunity to share ongoing shoreline and riverbank restoration and improvement efforts. Our productive and positive use of dredge material, the many ways that we're using innovation and efficiencies to address comprehensive benefits, identify and assist economically distressed and historically underserved communities and enhance resiliency to accommodate sea level rise and other impacts from global climate change. Most importantly, I look forward to working with this committee, the Congress administration to help address the nation's water resources challenges. The South Atlantic Division has a diverse civil works program that includes projects in commercial navigation, flood and storm damage risk reduction, and ecosystem restoration. Our region includes the navigation channels, ports, and waterways in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We're responsible for the Enterprise Deep Draft Navigation Center of Expertise, the Everglades Restoration Effort, the largest ecosystem restoration program in the world. 
I'm especially excited to highlight the South Atlantic Coastal Study, commonly referred to as SACS, the largest coastal risk assessment ever conducted by the Corps of Engineers, covering more than 60,000 miles, six states, and two territories. This is a mammoth undertaking, a great example of our goal to maximize the use of research and development while promoting community resilience through partnering. It best illustrates our effort to overcome institutional barriers and adapt to climate change to include sea level rise. America's water resources, rivers, wetlands, inland and coastal waterways, and more support billions of dollars in recreation and commerce, affect public safety, restore much needed habitat for fish and wildlife, and provide water supply benefits. Army Corps of Engineers decision makers must ascertain the federal interest for competing alternatives and recommend plans worthy of federal investment. In addition to the National Economic Benefits Account, innovative methods of determination are being implemented now to fully capture maximum benefits that may be affected by other accounts, to include regional economic development, environmental quality, and other social effects. Examples in my region of responsibility include the South Atlantic Coastal Study, Selma, the Charleston Peninsula, the San Juan Metro Flood Risk Management Projects. The aforementioned projects are but a sample, intended to highlight how the South Atlantic Division is addressing comprehensive benefits, identifying and assisting economically disadvantaged and distressed communities, to include rural and tribal communities and enhancing the resiliency of our shorelines and riverbanks to accommodate sea level rise and other global climate change impacts. As emphasized in Lieutenant General Spellman's testimony to this committee last month, Corps continues to seek opportunities to identify and document the full spectrum of economic, environmental, and other benefits to the nation. Projects that I've mentioned are all recent examples of this commitment in action committed to ensuring that the South Atlantic Division will continue to seek innovative ways to identify the most equitable and efficient solutions to our nation's water resources issues in a manner that is of high engineering, economic, and environmental quality. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you both for your, 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 your testimonies. Uh, my recollection is that you both have children, is that right? What, 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 General Graham, what do you have? Boy, girls? A couple of boys, what do you have? Senator, I've got two older girls and a younger boy. Okay. General Kelly? Senator, I have two boys. Yeah. So, Congresswoman uh, Blunt Rochester, our, our Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, and uh, others here, other elected, uh, we've been joined by our governor and the governor of, of Louisiana. We go to schools a lot. We get invited to all kinds of schools from kindergarten through up through graduate schools and colleges. And uh, uh, I love going to uh, grade schools, and we'll do assemblies. And uh, I'll always remember going to this one grade school down here in Sussex County. And I was introduced to speak in the auditorium. It was the kin kindergarten all the way back to, I think, fifth grade. And a little girl in the third grade stood up, and she said, to, after I'd made Ray my remarks, and she said, what do you do anyway? And I said, uh, well, I'm a United States senator. <laughs> and she said, well, what do you do? <laughs> And I said, well, I help make the rules for our country. I asked if she had, they had rules for her school. She said, yes. I said, you have rules for uh, on your bus? And she said, yes. I said, you have rules at home? She said, yes. I said, we have rules for our country. And along with 99 other senators, 435 U.S. representatives and the president, we help make the rules for the country. A little boy sitting next to her said, what else do you do? <laughs> and I responded, we help people. We help people in all different kinds of ways. And if, uh, as parents yourselves, um, if you're uh, in a school in Delaware or some other place and maybe a third or fourth grader stood up and said, what do you do at the Army Corps of Engineers? General Gamble, how, how would you explain it so that that child might, might be able to understand the importance of what, what you do? Senator, I, we help people too. We help communities like we're standing in, in here today. And, and that's why the 34,000 men and women who make up the Army Corps of Engineers uh, have joined us. 
because they value this work. They love delivering for the state of Delaware. Certainly the Philadelphia district that supports the state uh, is absolutely committed to that. So Senator, I think the, the way I would answer that is similar fashion. We help people. Good. I could barely see General Kelly's lips move when you gave that answer. So, <laughs> so I think you two are in harmony. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, General Graham, you have uh, previously testified that the core accounts for climate change when it formulates a project, and that's true. But it's clear that the Corps only formulates projects to address coastal and river storm surge and not the other impacts of climate change, such as extreme rainfall and sea level rise. In places like Delaware and Louisiana, the Corps' failure to account for a full range of climate impacts excludes a good number of projects from consideration and severely disadvantages these states. Here's my question. How can the provisions of this legislation I described earlier, the Shore Act, how can the provisions of that legislation help the Army Corps of Engineers better address the impacts of climate change in pro as you design projects to work on? Go ahead, please. Chairman Carper, yeah. thank you very much for that question. At the request of your team, we are currently working to answer that very question and preparing effect statements on the provisions of the Shore Act. And those will be available shortly. After the hearing, I'll certainly get on the phone and make sure that the, we'll check on their progress to make sure that um, those effect statements are on track. Chairman, regarding how we currently consider climate change, our authorities are based on the analysis of specific storm events. And to that end, we analyze all aspects of the flooding problem, including contributions from rainfall, high rivers, and sea level rise, which is known as combination flooding. And certainly to, to the testimony that you're gonna receive after us, the, the folks coming up from Louisiana, combination flooding with the Mississippi River, uh, the Gulf and hurricanes rolling in off the Gulf, they are ground zero for that combination flooding. We are in the Corps of Engineers consistently updating, innovating, and improving our engineering processes, our key modeling, and the research and development that underpins all of that engineering. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Maybe a follow, a quick follow. How should the Army Corps and the Office of Management and Budget uh, alter their budgeting process so that the Corps can better plan for and execute projects designed to address a broader range of climate change impacts? Chairman, thank you for that question. General Kelly touched on this earlier, and we've been working together for, for, for many, many years. Um, but the core strives always to maximize the benefits to help people. Our job is to provide Mr. Connor, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, with our best technical recommendation. And Mr. R.D. James, who was the previous Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, he provided uh, about two years ago, the core guidance to use all four of the PR uh, principles, requirements, and guidelines benefit categories that General Kelly spoke to earlier. The national economic development benefits, the regional economic development benefits, the environmental benefits, and the other societal benefits. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been allowed to use those all in the past. Or Mr. James allowed us to use those, and Mr. Connor has told us that he supports that decision and he's going to provide us refined guidance in the future. So Good. that's what uh, our teams are currently working on, to be able to provide all of those benefits. Thank you. Uh, an another question I've heard, General Graham, uh, Graham uh, relating to climate change in uh, project formulation. Uh, as you know, the new uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, sea level rise report uh, just came out on February 15th, um, not even two weeks ago. This report uh, paints a very um, sobering, a very sobering picture for our country, really for the world, but for our country at large about the needs to address climate change, but it also has real implication for uh, coastal communities like this community uh, right now. Um, as our Congresswoman, as our Lieutenant Governor knows, as our uh, Governor knows, <clears throat> Delaware is the lowest lying state in the country. Uh, our state is uh, uh, sinking, and uh, the seas around us are rising. If that doesn't get our attention, something is wrong. But here's my question. Uh, the report of the uh, of NOAA on sea level rise uh, uh, really underlines the need to, to address climate change, but it also has real implications for coastal communities like right now. 
uh, and technical assistance provided to uh, my staff for uh, during the drafting of both the shore legislation I keep talking about and the coming uh, Water Resources Development Act, which we hope to fold the Shore Act into the larger piece of legislation uh, later uh, this, uh, this spring. Uh, we're told that uh, when the report is final, the Corps will, uh, this is a quote, consider an update to technical guidance and if appropriate, update those documents. Given the, uh, the Corps was uh, the co-author of the report, what are the next steps for the agency in the process of incorporating the findings and updated sea level projections into uh, project design and implementation? I'll just say to you, you, uh, you our, our witnesses know this, if you go back 30, 40, 50, maybe 60, 70 years, look at sea level rise, uh, it's maybe eight, nine, 10 inches over close to a century. Uh, that's going to continue. Uh, that's the bad news. The really bad news is it's going to continue a lot faster. And the question is, can we are we fast enough on our feet to get uh, to get uh, ready for it and turn it around before it's too late? All right, uh, General Graham, go ahead. Jeremy Carver, uh, that is the question. It's not if the sea level behind us is, is going to rise; it's, it's when. And we've been incorporating for decades uh, various sea level rise scenarios that address that very question: not if, but when. And we will take a look at the specific geographical area, and we'll look at three scenarios, a high, medium, and low. And, and it's not, again, Jeremy, when the sea level is going to rise. Oh, sorry, it's not if the sea level is yeah. going to rise, it's, it's when. Uh, in General Kelly's area, you know, we're expecting one to two feet. In the, the Gulf region, um, certainly two feet. In, in this region, about a foot to 18 inches is, is what we're expecting, as the NOAA report said, over the next 50 to 60 years. And Chairman, as you said, that's accelerating. So, sir, you have our absolute commitment that we are going to ensure that our, our guiding engineering um, doctrine incorporates that in real time. All right. Um, I'm gonna turn now, General Colley, to a question or two for you, if I could, on the scope of feasibility studies. Um, as the leader of the South Atlantic Division, you currently oversee a number of studies and projects for communities in the Southeast, I think in Puerto Rico also, that are at risk from uh, climate change. And of course, a study of the Charleston Peninsula in Southern uh, Carolina and South Carolina. The initial project recommendations by the Corps raised significant public concerns, as you know. Public felt that there were several shortcomings in the Corps' decision-making, including an over-reliance on constructed project elements. Also, the exclusion of economically disadvantaged communities from the uh, project benefit area and a failure to identify holistic solutions that would address flood risk other than storm surge. Here's my question. What are the key lessons you learned from the Charleston Peninsula study process? And are there provisions in the Shore Act, this legislation I keep talking about, that will help future studies avoid the problems you've encountered? Chairman Copper, for me, uh, the first lesson and one that continues to provide benefits for my command. Good partnership, the value of good partnership, persistent engagement, and transparency cannot be overstated. Mm. The Charleston Peninsula has a high level of risk and vulnerability to coastal storms, and this is exacerbated by the combination that General Graham mentioned of sea level rise and climate change. And that was true over the period of analysis. The study investigated storm surge, but we also recognize that this area is prone to flooding, specifically sunny day tides, and, and that was not investigated in the study. Uh, the recommended plan has a robust uh, benefit to cost ratio, 11 to one, uh, and, and it will reduce risk posed by coastal storm surge and also enhance the city of Charleston's ability to quickly recover from storm surge disruptions. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the prominent feature of the plan is a storm surge wall, uh, but it also includes three areas of non-structural measures uh, where a storm surge wall was not optimal uh, based on topography and location of uh, storm surge sources. Two particular areas that I've called out is the Rosemont and Bridgewater Village, both economically disadvantaged communities within the study area 
Uh, the non-structural measures recommended in these communities uh, include flood proofing and structural elevation raises. When I think about the lesson learned and the persistent engagement, the study team engaged with residents and business owners uh, during the planning process through a series of outreach meetings. And based on this feedback, uh, we recognize the need to migrate from an environmental assessment to an environmental impact statement to make sure that we disclose the potentially uh, damaging environmental, cultural, and visual uh, impacts of the project. This EIS is underway, and uh, it will include a more detailed mitigation plan and a more robust environmental justice analysis. The core is currently preparing the effect statements, as General Graham mentioned, for the specific Shore Act. But I support a holistic process for flood risk management and full consideration of environmental justice for disadvantaged communities, without doubt. That's encouraging. Thank you very much. One, one last question, and I'm going to turn to our Congresswoman and, and then bring out our next panel. Um, General Graham, uh, uh, with respect to improving outreach and improving partner partnering, at the uh, Water Resources Development Oversight the hearing that our uh, committee held in Washington uh, last month, uh, General Spellman acknowledged that the Corps has a consistency problem when it comes to district outreach and partnering activities with local project stakeholders. Apparently, some districts reach out to communities within their areas of responsibility proactively, and they do it often, as you know, uh, while other districts largely leave communities in the dark to fend for themselves when it comes to identifying the opportunities that the core programs provide. Uh, we've experienced this at times in Delaware, and I believe we are on a path to resolving this problem here. Question. Uh, would you please uh, share a few of the details about the Corps' new partner partnering guidelines and playbook and explain how this new guidance will help the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers be a better partner in the future? Chairman Carver, again, thank you for that question. So the Corps doesn't do anything on its own, as we witnessed here in the state of Delaware. Improving partnerships and transparency has been a priority for Lieutenant General Spellman from day one. Our updated partnership guidance are focused on creating and maintaining sound partnerships to enable the safe delivery of quality projects that are on time and within budget. Sound partnership requires proactive engagements at all echelons, and it's rooted in three mutually supportive elements, commitment, collaboration, and most importantly, uh, collaboration. Um, and communication. Sorry, let me get that again. Commitment, collaboration, and communication. A lot of C's. A lot of C's. It's not corn, chicken, and, cr and corporations. But say, those, say those C's again, though. That's, those are good. <laughs> say it, uh, so, collaboration, right? What were the others? Commitment and communication. There we go. So, Senator, I think it's also a secret, secret for a long marriage. You think about it. <laughs> yes. Regarding that's a hearing for another day, please. Chairman, to some of the challenges we experienced here in Delaware, when we get new authorities, and, and, and I've got to pause here for a second to certainly thank this committee for getting a Water Resource and Development Act every two years. That allows my team to get good at taking those new authorities and putting those to work for the American people, getting the implementation guidance to General Kelly so that we can put those to work. And so we greatly appreciate, sir, your leadership on having those bills every two years. It's, that's wonderful. Teamwork, are, teamwork makes the dream work. There you go. Absolutely. Uh, the challenge we've got is to, I've got to help the divisions and the districts take those new authorities and put them to practice. And that was probably my failing here in Delaware is that I didn't help out the Philadelphia district fast enough mm. to understand some of these new authorities and bring up some of the expertise. General Kelly has an amazing team down in Mobile that had that expertise and, and it was my failing for being too slow to connect General Kelly's expertise to the need here with the Philadelphia district to support Delaware. So Senator, that's my commitment is to do a better job at making those connections. Well. You have atoned for your sins, and uh, we're going to go uh, go forward and do great work here together. Thanks, thanks so much. 
Okay, uh, uh, Congresswoman, you're now recognized for the next hour. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. I think it's five minutes, but oh, okay. <laughs> I'll take an hour. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Um, we know that here in Delaware, this is not new for you. These are not new issues for you. And uh, we want to thank you for walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Uh, and also for allowing us to participate in, in today's uh, field hearing. You can go ahead and take the full hour. Okay. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I also want to uh, thank all of our witnesses uh, for your testimony. And as uh, our, our uh, the chairman was saying, all of our seas of chickens and cards and chemicals, I don't know if you said chemicals, but chemicals, all of the different seas. I see the, the mayor shaking his head on that one. Um, I, I also want to highlight another C, which is strong communities. And really one of the reasons we're here today and even doing this field hearing where we're doing it is because we have strong communities in Delaware that have spoken up about the needs and sounded the alarm about the sense of urgency for our economy, for our environment, and also for our quality of life. And so I want to thank all of the community members, the mayors, the, 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 the town councils, everyone who is participating today, our lieutenant governor and governor, uh, because we are a strong community. I'm also honored to participate in this important hearing and am proud to uh, have introduced HR 6705, the Bipartisan Shore Act, uh, which the gov look, I almost called you governor, back, kind of harken back. Governor Carney looked up very quickly, which, uh, which uh, the chairman uh, has already uh, shared with you is the Shoreline Health Oversight Restoration Resilience and Enhancement Act along with my colleague, Representative Graves. I think it's important to note that this bill, this legislation is bicameral, meaning in the House and the Senate, which means it has a great chance of passing, and it's bipartisan. And I also think that's important to note, uh, particularly in this moment where people feel we can't problem solve, and we're coming together to find common ground to problem solve for our coastlines, our riverbanks, and um, our shorelines. And so I want to thank you for your leadership. And uh, the goal of this legislation is simple. It's to address the ongoing flooding crisis that our coastal communities and riverbank communities continue to face. And if I were asked um, uh, what, what the Army Corps, what would I say to a fifth grader? I would say they're problem solvers. They, they help us to problem solve and help us to really attack these issues. I want to thank you again, uh, Senator Carper, and also uh, Senator Cassidy for your leadership. And uh, I will have my first question. And my first question is to General Kelly. Shore protection and restoration projects that utilize nature-based features such as dunes are highly adaptable to climate change. However, it's unclear whether the Corps interprets existing authorities to permit projects to be modified in order to increase their resilience. Having assumed command in, uh, of the South Atlantic Division in 2020, you have firsthand knowledge of the Jacksonville District's uh, efforts to modify federally authorized shore protection projects for enhanced resilience. I have a three-part question for you. You might want to take a note. How has the Jacksonville District worked to enhance the resiliency of federally authorized shore protection projects? Were there legal hurdles, that's number two, and are there authorities needed that could support rebuilding or repairing coastal projects at a higher level of resilience? Representative Blunt Rochester, thank you so much uh, for that question. I, I, I get excited about such things because innovative and efficient approach, uh, approaches to uh, incorporate dunes in our existing projects is something we're working hard to do. We had some challenges in the Jacksonville District. We had a re-nourishment effort program for over a dozen projects, but only constructed one. And we were unable to construct because making betterments to projects funded with flood control and coastal emergency funds with construction funds is not something could do. I've got some good news I want to share in the story. 
something I consider a win. We set precedent trying to do this in that better understood what funds we could use. We use that knowledge to bring several projects up to a modern standard. So we looked back and we're now moving out with this under our regular program. And so in this tale is goodness that we're now using to improve the resiliency in Florida as a result of existing authorities. And so to the third uh, part of your question, additional authorities, uh, I absolutely favor effort that helps us build innovative climate resilient infrastructure, but we've also got to maximize the authorities we have. And that was the lesson I took from the aforementioned effort in Jackson. Excellent. So again, there are some authorities that we could use more, and then you will share with us additional ones that uh, you'd like to see. My next question is for uh, General Graham, and I, and I like that answer because as we were talking about going from gray infrastructure to green infrastructure and being more resilient, and I know there are some folks in the audience as well uh, that I saw that focus on these issues as well. Um, General Graham, as you know, um, what works in Delaware doesn't necessarily work in other states. Um, each project, design, and problem comes with unique environmental and engineering needs. The Corps historically has had a rigid perceived, and some in here would say yes, I see a few shaking heads, a top-down approach um, to project design and execution. And in some ways, this top-down approach is necessary, um, but in more ground-up, community-based approach is also needed to accurately identify projects and community needs. What flexibilities are needed for the Corps to better incorporate community input and to account for individual project, project needs while still addressing the needs of regions and the country as a whole. Representative Blunt, Rochester, thank you so much for, for that question. And there's multiple answers to it. Uh, first and foremost, we've got to empower our divisions and our districts to, to get innovative. We've got to ensure that we're empowering our divisions and their subordinate districts to reach out to communities to make sure that we're, we're clearly listening to them. Now, when we give authority and funding to the divisions to do these feasibility studies, we, we, we start a clock ticking on, on we've got to have them done in three years. Now, we can extend beyond that three years. Congress has given us the flexibility to do that with the uh, approval of the Assistant Secretary. So we want to work rapidly to find solutions to those problems, Representative, as you mentioned, but we also have to be mindful that sometimes reaching consensus with the communities who we're partnering with might take a little bit more time. And so we're trying to strike that right balance of ensuring that we're delivering safely quality projects on time within schedule to include our feasibility studies, but also acknowledging that reaching out and making sure that we're truly listening to communities like in Charleston might take a bit more time. And that's why I'm using the Charleston as an example. We went from uh, an environmental assessment to a full-blown environmental impact statement. And, and, and the big difference there for the, for the lay people, and I know this is uh, an audience mainly of experts, but it's really that we're listening more and making sure that citizens have their voices heard about what we're doing in their communities. As a follow-up, one of the challenges that we've all talked about is time. There really isn't the time. And I, I wonder, as a um, part of the listening, is also reaching out to communities to ask how to work better with them. Uh, I think that that might be a, a good listening starting point as well. Um, so I think that'd be something that we'd love to follow up on as, as well. What, what, what ways concretely and in an expeditious manner, because we know time is of the essence. Um, my next question uh, is to you, General Kelly. Um, as you know, climate change is exacerbating, exacerbating coastal flooding across the country, but the coastlines of the United States and territories also face unique regional challenges. The Corps completed the North Atlantic Coastal Comprehensive Study 
2015, and you are in the process of finalizing the report, as was mentioned, for the South uh, Atlantic Coastal Study. How do coastal protection and restoration challenges facing communities in the Northeast and in the Southeast of the continental United States compare? President Blunt Rochester, having been a commander in the North Atlantic Division under General Graham's charge, uh, I'm very familiar uh, with that effort. Uh, I was the commander uh, in Norfolk. Uh, so much of the work that is now underway that General Graham and Mr. Connor will see, I was the commander when that commenced. Very familiar with the challenges in Northeast, at, at least the Southern boundary, I guess it'd be used by our watershed in Norfolk, uh, but now in the Southeast. I, I'd like to compare the North Atlantic Coastal Study with the South Atlantic Coastal Study that, that's underway now using that knowledge. Both studies seek understanding. Both studies address coastal storm, flood risk to vulnerable populations, property, ecosystems, and infrastructure. I think that's the same in the Northeast and in the Southeast. Perhaps the, the biggest difference when I think about the North Atlantic Coastal Study and where we are with the South Atlantic Coastal Study is the North Atlantic Coastal Study was on the heels of Sandy. And though we had Irma and Maria in uh, territories, U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, we have an opportunity to take that understanding that's not unique to the North or the South and apply it here in the continental United States. The other thing that I offer between the two studies and insights and attempt to compare and contrast. What we're doing different with the South Atlantic Coastal Study now is the tools are available. Coastal hazard system, we're sharing and able to make decisions. So whatever differences there may be, we're apprised, we're alive and aware, and we're communicating that to our partners. So I think some of the communication that you asked us to do in a more aggressive way, this particular effort is gonna help us do that. And I think we'll reap benefits from it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, am under my hour allotted time and I yield back. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for uh, your wonderful stewardship. Uh, in, the, in the state of uh, Delaware in so many, uh, so many ways, and for being here to, today and for providing your leadership in, in the House of Representatives as a, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. There's a bunch of committees in the House. The committee that everybody wants to be on is the Energy and Commerce Committee. Not everybody can serve on it. She does, which is a good thing for uh, Delaware, and I think a very good thing for our country. So. All righty. Um, well, generals, General Graham, General Kelly, we appreciate uh, your continued dedication and service to uh, to this country. I'm going to say, I wish all you could be sitting up here with us and just watching uh, the expressions on their faces, their eyes, as they they talk about the work that the responsibilities that they uh, have and the uh, the relish with which they they uh, address them. And uh, I like to say, everything I do, I know I can do better. And we heard from the Army Corps that uh, as good as they are, they know they can do better as well. And uh, we're in this together. And uh, together, we're going to make uh, a huge impact and a huge difference at a time when that's very much needed and expected by the people of this country. So thank you. I never ask uh, when we hold hearings in, in Washington uh, for uh, people to give a, a round of applause for a, 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 a panel of witnesses. I don't think I've ever done that. But the Army Corps of Engineers is so extraordinarily important in this state and such great, huge help in this, this state. I'm going to refrain from applauding, but I want everybody else to go ahead and give them a nice round of applause. All right, that's enough. <laughs> Never enough. Thank you so much. And uh, with uh, you're now excused, and we're going to transition to mm -hmm. our second panel. They'll get a big round of applause too, I'm sure, when they finish. And uh, we're uh, delighted to welcome our second panel of witnesses, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. consists of four unique voices in the coastal community. This includes two sitting governors, a mayor, and the director of a nonprofit dedicated to coastal state issues. If y'all would come up and join us, that would be great.
Well, first, uh, let me uh, warmly welcome not one, but two governors, two distinguished governors from the state of Louisiana, from the state of Delaware. Now, governor Edwards uh, took office in 2016 as the, I think, the 56th governor of Louisiana. He did such a, uh, an outstanding job uh, that Louis uh, Louisiana's uh, elected him to a second term in 2020. That doesn't always happen in this business. Uh, but especially when the, the kind of challenges that we face today, as you face today as governors. But uh, before taking office, uh, Governor Edwards, a West Point graduate, uh, served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, eventually rising to command a rifle company in the 82nd Airborne Division before stepping down with the rank of captain. It is an honor to have you here with us in the first state, Governor Edwards. Um, you're recognized for your remarks. Common sense, practical, smart, surrounds himself with really smart people, uh, respected by uh, by governors across the, the, the nation and certainly respected by the people within his own state. His uh, senators, who are both Republicans, speak very highly of, of this of this man who is a Democrat. We're delighted that uh, that you're here. And along with John Carney, is somebody who's really good at working across the aisle and getting stuff done. Governor, welcome aboard. Can you get somebody? Just I, am I think I am now. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Senator Carper, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester. It's great to be here with you all this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with my friend, Governor Carney, as well. Uh, I think your committee's focus on restoring shorelines and riverbanks to address climate change um, is very important. It resonates with me as we strive in Louisiana to save our coast uh, from what is a land loss crisis. Um, additionally, I'm grateful that you and your colleagues passed a disaster supplemental to help us recover from hurricanes Ida mm -hmm. and Laura and Delta, uh, as well as bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, this funding has given us a historic opportunity to make significant progress for our coast, and we thank you very much. In Louisiana, we obviously depend upon a very close relationship with the Army Corps of Engineers. Our economy, our environment rely upon their success in achieving uh, their mission to promote navigation, provide flood control, and restore aquatic ecosystems. Uh, coastal and riverine areas uh, show the need to manage for all three independent objectives as impacts related to climate change become increasingly apparent and severe. I recommend, the, uh, I'm sorry, I commend the committee uh, for considering how to improve the synergy between the core mission and the need to restore our nation's shorelines and riverbank ecosystems. I endorse the heightened focus on these coastal issues and encourage the court to elevate its commitment to coastal protection and restoration. As you may know, Louisiana was built largely by the movement of the Mississippi River as it spread out the collected soils from across the drainage basin that now covers 31 states and two Canadian provinces. Yet that river no longer sustains our coastal landscape. Since 1930, Louisiana, as you noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Louisiana has lost 2,000 square miles of coastal wetlands, um, and as you also noted, that is about the size of Delaware. The loss began uh, following the Great Flood of 1927, when Congress charged the Corps with ensuring navigation and providing flood control. The Corps succeeded, uh, but interventions such as levees unfortunately keep the Mississippi River sediment trapped until it spills into the Gulf of Mexico, and so it no longer provides land sustaining benefit to the coast. It doesn't replace that, that, uh, that sediment and, and nourish our coastline. Uh, and as a result, we continue to lose a football field every hundred minutes. Uh, if it weren't for recent hurricanes, uh, however, our state was poised uh, to start building more land than we were losing for the first time since 1930. But just in Hurricane Ida, we lost 106 square miles of land. Uh, with Now, some of that will naturally regenerate, but it still will be a net loss at the end of the day. With each acre converted to open water, our vibrant ecosystems shrink, our infrastructure becomes more exposed, our communities face heightened risk, and our natural carbon sinks lose capacity to offset greenhouse gas emissions. Every day, the importance of restoring our coastal and riverine ecosystems becomes more evident. Coastal land loss is an immediate existential threat to our state and climate change will only intensify the impact. While sediment starvation and subsidence have been major drivers of historic land loss, sea level rise from climate change will become a dominant cause of our coastal wetland loss in the near future, magnified by more frequent and more intense storms. 
Uh, for decades, coastal land loss was a slow-moving cat uh, catas catastrophe that was left unaddressed. It took the devastating hurricane season of 2005, you'll always remember Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, to galvanize our state into action. We created the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, call it the CPRA, to be the single entity in the state charged with integrating hurricane protection and coastal wetland restoration. We recognize that protecting communities and coastal ecosystems do go hand in hand, and strategic planning is foundational. CPRA develops with significant input from the public and stakeholders a science-based coastal master plan every six years, and each update has been adopted by our state legislature with unanimous support. That master plan calls for coastal protection restoration projects over 50 years and projected investment of $50 billion. And I am proud to say that we are now committing over a billion dollars each year to improve our coast. Reconnecting the Mississippi River in order to harness the sustaining land building power of its sediment is a cornerstone principle of the Coastal Master Plan. And I'm also happy to say that we're making great progress. CPRA is in the final year of a, a federal permitting for the $2 billion mid Barataria sediment diversion project that would reconnect the Mississippi River uh, to the Barataria Bay estuary, which has the highest rates of land loss in South Louisiana. This project is a critical component in our continued recovery from the deep water horizon oil spill also. The state has entered uh, the federal permitting process for a similar project on the east bank of the Mississippi River, the mid Breton Sediment Diversion Project. And these projects have been supported by three consecutive presidential administrations through the permitting process. However, even with that support, Getting to the decision point has been a real challenge. Uh, one way this committee could help would be to encourage federal agencies such as the Corps, EPA, and the Council on Environmental Quality to ensure timely decision making. Uh, simply put, we're in a race against time and we can't afford unnecessary delays. The projects are designed to improve the overall environment and the sooner they are constructed, the sooner our coastal communities can experience their benefits. After Hurricane Katrina, Louisiana greatly benefited from the federal investments in the Hurricane Risk Reduction System, also known as HISTRIX, and we want to thank you for the very generous help that you provided to our state. Uh, it provides hurricane protection and resiliency to the greater New Orleans area. And your committee heard how valuable the investment proved to be after Hurricane Ida made landfall this past August as one of the strongest storms to ever strike Louisiana. The previous storm that, that matched its intensity was one year before, which gives evidence to the increasing frequency and severity uh, of our weather. Your committee uh, heard how important it was and, and how well it performed withstanding the storm and preventing billions of dollars of property damage. The strengthened system protected hundreds of thousands of people and tens of thousands of businesses uh, from the worst impacts of the storm, and it was the first major test of hurricane storm damage risk reduction system since it was built and it absolutely performed as it was intended to. And I'm very proud that General Spellman testified to this committee that a key element of the success of that system during Hurricane Ida was the presence of a number of restoration projects that had been constructed by the state and by local government. I encourage the Corps to seek additional opportunities to connect ecosystem restoration projects with protection projects. Uh, granting credit uh, to restoration projects within the same area of the protection projects that require mitigation achieves this goal. And we have an example in Louisiana right now under consideration. It would be the use of the Maurepas Swamp Freshwater Diversion Project as mitigation for the West Shore Lake Pontchartrain Hurricane Protection System. The project would provide in-basin mitigation by sustaining 45,000 acres of swamp, uh, optimize cost savings, and reduce risk to the West Shore Levee System once it's constructed. Uh, through our coastal master plan, Louisiana has articulated a clear, widely supported vision for a more sustainable coast, and I'm hopeful that the Corps will work closely with us to achieve it. And I want to tell you, we're no longer just reacting to disasters, we're taking action. Earlier this month, uh, the Climate Task Force that I established completed its work and submitted the first ever uh, climate action plan for our state, which is a balanced, an implementable plan that charts a comprehensive pathway to net zero. The plan received unanimous backing from the members of the task force and it's the first climate action plan created by any state in the deep south. I've included a copy of 
the executive summary of our climate action plan is an attachment to my testimony. Mr. Chairman, this is the overarching view of the challenges Louisiana faces from major environmental threats and how we're responding to them. Alignment with the core is absolutely critical to our success. And therefore, I want to commend you, Senator Cassidy, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester, and Representative Graves. Uh, this really is a Louisiana, Delaware, or I should say a Delaware, Louisiana uh, <laughs> effort. The bill would apply the urgency. We, we did come first, so. <laughs> I understand. Uh, I, the bill would apply the urgency that Louisiana has to address the challenges along our shores and rivers nationwide. And I greatly appreciate the provisions of the Shore Act that would help my state, such as authorizing the Upper Barataria Basin Risk Reduction System, funding ecosystem restoration for Mr. Go, um, helping the state receive credit from the core uh, for the projects that we do, and conducting the Lower Mississippi River Comprehensive Study. As I detail in the written statement, I also encourage the committee to direct the Corps to use its existing authority to be more flexible on the land rights it requires for restoration and mitigation. Louisiana has worked well for decades with private landowners on many restoration projects without purchasing land outright. Conservation easements are entirely sufficient, they're faster, they are cheaper, and they allow for a more favorable cost-benefit ratio for important projects. So I encourage the Corps to adopt the same approach. Uh, obviously, funding is, is paramount to achieving our goals. Revenue shared from offshore oil and gas development through GoMesa has been an essential funding source for coastal restoration protection in Louisiana. It's how we've gotten to over a billion dollars a year in these investments. And I want you to know our Constitution dedicates every dollar to coastal restoration and protection. However, for years, we've received a very limited amount of impact assistance compared to the revenue collected in uh, I mean, with respect to how interior states are treated, I should say. Uh, while this bill is not in your committee's jurisdiction, I do implore you to support the RISE Act. Uh, the legislation makes long overdue improvements to Go Mesa, and for the first time ever would establish revenue sharing for offshore wind production, which is important for your state and for mine. Offshore wind is something that we are strongly pursuing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've developed an ecosystem restoration program that is as comprehensive and forward thinking as any other such plan in the world. Uh, we are attempting to restore a coastal ecosystem where over 2 million people live, where billions of dollars of industrial investment and critical infrastructure exist. The importance of our working coast to our state and to the country simply cannot be overstated. And so we must restore it, we must protect it. And ensuring the Corps has the authority, but also the direction to increase its focus on coastal shoreline and riverine ecosystems is of the utmost importance to the overall sustainability of the state of Louisiana. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to receiving and answering your questions. Governor Edwards, we're delighted to be your partner and in uh, and, and all of this and, and other issues as, as well. Um, how many people here are from Delaware? Raise your hand. How many here have actually personally met Governor John Carney? How many of you think you know him pretty well? I'll mention a, a couple of things that, that you may not know and then yield to him. Um, we talked a lot about football fields. Every 100 minutes they lose in Louisiana. Piece of land the size of a football field uh, to the sea. John Carney knows a thing or two about football fields. And Governor Edwards for uh, as a uh, high school of football stand. He's a great athlete, basketball, football, other sports. But, but he was all-state uh, quarterback for us, played in the blue goal game. He uh, went on to a school at, uh, he's waitlisted at Ohio State, but he, <laughs> but he managed to get into Dartmouth somehow <laughs> and, and was a scholar athlete there and all Ivy defensive back, as I recall there. And uh, come back in back to Delaware and I, well, my recollection is a great, is a great resume, but I got a guy named Tubby Raymond who was our football coach for like ever at the University of Delaware, 300 wins, which is, as you know, is a lot of wins for a college football. And John Carney was one of his assistants during part of that time. And later on, uh, worked as a, a top aide in Delaware to uh, Joe Biden when Joe was a mere mortal. He was our, our, uh, our U.S. Uh, senator. Uh, ended up uh, helping run Newcastle County, where about two-thirds of our people lived. And, and as the, uh, as the um, deputy chief of staff to a, a lucky governor at one time, he negotiated the purchase of the Port of Wilmington 
from the city of Wilmington, which had no money to invest in the port and engineered the uh, turnaround of the port of Wilmington, which is now just a standout port and one we're enormously proud of. Uh, he helped lead a team of uh, Delaware officials to Wall Street and convinced the um, major rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor and Fitch, to, for the first time in the history of Delaware, to raise our credit rating to a triple A. We're proud of the report as a rating that we continue to enjoy. Other than that, he's not done much. <laughs> no, that's just a uh, that's just a a, a very brief brief uh, uh, overview of what he's done. But the, the real test for uh, for John Carney was uh, to be governor uh, during the wor worst pandemic in, in 100 years. Uh, I was fortunate to be governor during eight day, eight uh, uh, good years, uh, plenty. Started hard and then it got better and better and better. But uh, he's uh, had to lead us through it incredibly difficult, and he's done it with uh, with the heart and uh, with uh, good, uh, great communications and the willingness just to, to be courageous and to provide the leadership by example that uh, that uh, we so ad admire in, in in our staff. Uh, other than that, can you think of anything else good to say about? <laughs> that just scratches the surface. That just scratches the surface. But he's uh, now our. Uh, uh, our governor he serves us, serves us for uh, we have only one uh, representative and that's now Lisa but served as our congressman for for six years and did so uh, extraordinary as go through the Wilmington train station there's a great photograph of John Carney Chris Coons and I walking arm in arm down the platform of the train station uh, a shot taken from, from us from behind and it's one of my all-time all all-time favorites uh, and I what I will say to other, when I get off the train, and then at, the, at the end of the day, we have people from other states, and they, they, I say to me, we walk by the pictures, beautiful pictures. They say, "Who are those three guys?" And and I tell them who. They said, "John Carney, you're so lucky that he's your governor." And you know, we really are. We really, are. John, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being a staunch, staunch advocate for coastal funding and. And for fighting to help keep our beaches and keep them some of the finest in the world and you're recognized for your opening statement thank you thank you very much uh senator carper i almost called you governor carper there i was when somebody mentioned that earlier i was ready to say you want to be governor again you can have it <laughs> <laughs> thanks uh for that introduction it reminds me of something my brother-in-law says which is the older we get the better we used to be and I think in my case, people, <clears throat> it's been so long, people don't remember, so they, they can't verify the, the facts there. I've, I've had a great example of leadership with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate everything that you've done for me in my public service. And John, Con John Connor is oftentimes re referred to as one of the two finest governors we've ever had. <laughs> I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, with Governor Ed Edwards. He, we are colleagues in the National Governors Association. He's one of the most respected governors in our country uh, for the reasons that, that you outlined. And uh, you can hear his command of, of the material in, in his opening statement. We certainly appreciate his service to our country. He's a graduate from the, the U.S. Military Academy, West Point, and his service there. Uh, but he's been a, a great leader in a very difficult time for the state of Louisiana. I'm just delighted that he's here with us. Uh, I'm also happy to be here with so many of the elected officials that are our partners. Uh, we're gonna hear from the mayor here uh, at Slaughter Beach. I missed the tour yesterday, I apologize for that, but they are clearly our partners in all this work. I couldn't recognize most of them because they had masks on, but I did see uh, Mayor Becker across from, from me and is a great partner in Lewis. Last year, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control launch Delaware's climate action plan. Governor, <laughs> <laughs> you heard, uh, we heard about uh, Louisiana's uh, climate action plan, and I would recommend this to, to every Delaware, and it's got great information. It's really a, an easy read. It sets the technical standards right at the top. It was the result of a long process involving residents, businesses, and, and technical experts, uh, a matter of Congresswoman, to your point about community engagement. This roadmap shows how Delaware can prepare for climate change and must prepare for climate change in the decades ahead by reducing two, two main objections, reducing uh, co uh, carbon emissions and focusing on coastal resilience, which is what this hearing is, is about in your legislation. 
In 2017, Delaware joined uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance with many other states and, and local governments, committing to reduce our carbon emissions by at least 26% by 2025 over 2005 levels. We're, we're not there yet, but we're making progress. Right now, the estimate is that we're between 18 and 19% reduction, so we do have uh, some work to do there. We're here today, though, to talk about the impacts of sea level rise caused by, by climate change. Delaware has already experienced over one foot of sea level rise at the Lewis uh, tidal gauge since 1900, so over the last century, a foot uh, of sea rise there in Lewis. By mid-century, sea levels are projected to rise another 9 to 23 inches and by the next century up to an additional five feet. This threatens our Atlantic beaches and bay communities, neighborhoods, businesses, and for the residents of those communities, importantly, uh, it threatens their way of life. Delaware, as, as has been mentioned, is our country's lowest lying state. Governor, you probably thought you were the lowest lying state, and I guess in some areas you're below sea level, best I could tell. Here in Sussex County, tourism employs 17,000 people and contributes $213 million in state and local taxes. These might not sound like big numbers to our friends in larger states, uh, including in Louisiana, but those are big numbers for uh, the state of Delaware with uh, just under a million residents. During COVID-19, we've made decisions with the understanding that you need to have a healthy community to have a healthy economy. You've got to strike a balance there. It's also true that you need to have a healthy environment to have, have a healthy economy. One, and particularly in this case, affects the other. To that end, we're grateful, extremely grateful, for the inf investments in inf infrastructure that are coming to Delaware through the bipartisan infrastructure bill that both of you were, were part of passing, a champion by you and by, uh, by the president. And I know it achieves exactly what President Biden intended, which was a bipartisan piece of legislation that enables us to build back better. And I think those words hit it, uh, the nail on the head when it comes to climate change because these investments will give us the opportunity to build back better by embedding climate resiliency in all infrastructure pro projects and focus on reducing carbon emissions. This will help us meet those goals for carbon emission reductions by 2025, because it includes a $17 million investment, which is a big number in Delaware, to expand Delaware's electric vehicle charging network. And this is a critical investment as we move towards more uh, to electric vehicle transportation in our state. And it's critical to us meeting those uh, carbon emis uh, emission. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester mentioned the idea of nature-based uh, features in resilience projects. And we know of one. We have an active one right now in Prime Hook uh, Wildlife Refuge, which is a federal owned assets. And they've restored the dunes that, which were destroyed by a number of Northeast storms over the last you know, 10 or more years. They've restored those dorms, those uh, dunes, uh, with the expectation that they will let Mother Nature run its course in the years ahead, as opposed to continuing to restore the dorms the dunes uh, on a kind of regular basis with the, as the storms come through. You, you can see the effect there more dramatically, I think, than anywhere, because the parking lot that used to be at the edge of the beach is now 20 yards out into the bay. And that's really what the kinds of effects that we're talking about here in our state. The ocean and bay beaches are part of Delaware's history. The Delaware Bay was a lifeline and resource during the early colonial period. It fueled transportation and a maritime economy that ultimately supported the foundation of our state. Today, we're approaching a new normal under climate change. Storms, hurricanes, and other weather events are more prevalent. We're seeing so-called 100-year floods every few years instead of once in a lifetime, it seems. When I took the oath of office uh, to become Delaware's 74th governor, I pledged not only to uphold our Constitution, 
Plato and I quote, respect the right of future generations to share the rich historic and natural heritage of our state. Both of you have taken that pledge before. We live in a beautiful state and we should take care to preserve that heritage as we pledge to do. That includes upholding the goals laid out in our climate action plan, incorporating the action plans objectives into the resources provided by the federal bipartisan infrastructure bill, and we will do that. We can only do this by limiting carbon emissions. We need to expand clean and renewable energy, put in place energy efficiency measures, transition our transportation sector to zero emission vehicles, and reduce and manage greenhouse gases beyond carbon dioxide. We also need to prepare for the environmental challenges we've just now beginning to see. Resiliency efforts like improving real-time data collection of coastal flooding and providing training, tools, and technical assistance on climate change impacts may sound simple, but they're critical for us to be prepared and to act. And let me end by thanking both of you for your leadership uh, for our great state, uh, you, Senator Carper, for being a mentor for your leadership of, of this committee and for this piece of legislation that will help us as we attempt to implement Delaware's action plan and address the coastal resiliency issues that we'll need to address. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, we have mentored each other. And I might say the same thing for uh, our Congresswoman. And uh, thanks for your extraordinary leadership, Don, and for being with us today. Um, we're gonna hear from Mayor Locke. We're going to hear from uh, Derek, and, and then I'm going to take a quick break, take a phone call, get an update on the Ukraine, and come right back. Uh, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to ask Lisa to preside uh, for the uh, beginning of the questioning of this, this panel. Uh, Mayor, 46 years ago, 46 years ago, uh, I can understand you and your maybe mom and dad bought a place in Slaughter Beach. And, uh, uh, and still, you're not just still living there, you still have a place there, but you're the mayor. The mayor and uh, we were. You have you ever been the uh, the vice mayor uh, at Slaughter Beach? Ever been the vice mayor? I was. How about secretary? How about treasurer? How about council person at large? All the seats. You've been through all of them and retired from the government consulting arena after joining a career specializing in large scale federal government procurement and acquisition projects. Uh, you are amazing, and uh, you're a great gift from your parents. And we're glad that they brought you here all those years ago and you stuck around and uh, continue to provide a, a, a wonderful leadership for not just Slaughter Beach, but for, for all of our beaches. Thank you, you're recognized. Senator, and thank you, Chairman Carper and Congresswoman Blunt Rochester and esteemed members of this panel who are testifying with me today. It's an honor to be here. Um, it was an honor to have been invited and I can't tell you how happy I am to be representing small coastal towns as we confront the challenges of sea level rise and increasingly violent coastal storms. Um, on behalf of the entire Delaware Bay communities, I, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Um, let me tell you about Slaughter Beach quickly. If I might, Slaughter Beach is one of three incorporated towns. First of all, take, take 30 seconds. Tell us, tell us why it's called Slaughter Beach. Everybody asks me that question. <laughs> and I say, call the mayor. There are so many reasons. All right, we'll make that an American uh, appendum to the, your testimony. Some, some stories are much funnier than others. Oh, good, good. Humor is everything. Uh, but the town consists of over 12,000 acres, 98% of which are in conservation and owned by the federal government, Department of Interior, as part of Prime Hope National Wildlife Refuge, or the state of Delaware, the Milford Neck Conservation Area, Delaware Nature Society. Um, we enjoy living next to an unspoiled and pristine saltwater marsh, and it is one of the last few saltwater marshes left in the United States. Um, the residents of Slaughter Beach are stewards of over three miles of uh, Delaware Bay shoreline, and we take our stewardship responsibilities very seriously. We are a horseshoe crab sanctuary and a certified wildlife habitat community. 
we maintain 20 access points to the Bayshore and welcome the public to our beaches. Our beaches are a primary breeding ground for horseshoe crabs and are an important stop on the Atlantic Flyway for migrating shorebirds, most especially the endangered red knot, a small bird that feeds on horseshoe crab eggs to fuel their annual migration from the furthest tip of South America to their Arctic breeding grounds. As mayor, I bring the perspective of a frontline community leader who lives with both the pleasures and threats of the sea. I've worked closely with the mayor of Bowers Beach, Ada Puzo, and the mayor of Lewis, Ted Becker, who's here today. As we followed the progress of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' beneficial use of dredged material for the Delaware River Feasibility Study, we were delighted by its inclusion in the Water Resources Development Act of 2020. And a special thanks goes to you, Senator Carper, and to you, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, for your leadership and, and your support in making that happen for the Delaware Bay communities. I'd like to say that horseshoe crabs play a significant role in human health and wellness. I've res I recently read about the critical role that the blood of horseshoe crabs played in the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. And there are countless other pharmaceutical breakthroughs that are, have been dependent on the blood of horseshoe crabs. Um, had, and um, due to coastal storms, horseshoe crabs require sandy beaches to lay their eggs and breed. And due to the increasing um, prevalence of coastal storms, we are losing our sandy beaches and horseshoe crab breeding grounds at an alarming rate. Um, we had a storm that we experienced on October 29th of this year. I have some pictures that I neglected to put up, but um, it shows the loss of breeding grounds, a uh, habitat grounds and how every beach on the Delaware Bay was impacted and affected by this one relatively mild storm. Last year, the town of Slaughter Beach, and I'm going to briefly touch on this because I believe it shows the importance of the partnerships that we need to um, um, sustain to, to manage our, our coastal uh, and preserve our coastal properties. Last year, the town of Slaughter Beach invoiced approximately $90,000 in property taxes. That was it. And of that amount of money, 60,000 went to collect trash and recycling fees. You know, leaving our entire operating budget, with the exception of what we get from grants, at $30,000 for our operating budget. I think it displays the need for the, the partnership that we have been um, uh, trying desperately to build with federal, state, county, and local officials. Um, I'm very pleased because of that. I'm very pleased with the provisions of the Shore Act. And would again like to thank you, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester and Chairman Carper for co-sponsoring this bipartisan and bicameral bill. And for your involvement and concern in Delaware's coastal towns, beaches, dunes, and wetlands. To our national leaders who truly understand the importance of our coastal communities and the vulnerabilities we endure as the global climate warms Weather becomes more erratic and seas rise at unprecedented rates. This legislation envisions a better way for the nation to prepare for future needs to address the problems that will only be exacerbated in the near future. We on the coast rely on our partnerships with county, state, and federal government officials to help us protect and sustain our community. In Delaware, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control is the non-federal partner on core projects. 
In our experience, however, communication between the core DENREC and the community, communities in need of assistance is limited at best. One exception to this is when Senator Carper's staff arranged for a core 101 meeting for local Delaware communities. That day, three years ago now, was extremely informative and had it not been for Senator Carper's staff's understanding that collaboration and information sharing was desperately needed, I doubt core staff would have had the vision to coordinate the effort and I suspect it will not happen again unless someone outside the core arranges it. This needs to change. I implore core and DENREC leadership to strengthen communication channels and see the world through the lens of local elected officials. We usually have little or no knowledge of how the core functions or the regulatory constraints that it must operate under. And I'd like to note that frontline community leadership changes hands frequently. So annual outreach efforts to educate community leaders is a key component of cooperation and collaboration. The SURE Act is a valuable tool in clarifying the Corps' mission, modernizing the Corps, and streamlining Corps interaction with the communities it serves. I call out three specific inclusions in the SURE Act that I'm particularly happy about. First, the expansion of the Corps' existing River Flood Mitigation and Restoration Authority that will now include shoreline protection and restoration first time as a primary mission of the Corps. Second, the identification of Delaware Bay beaches as a priority area for implementation of projects under the amended authority. Finally, and perhaps the best news, Section 15 modifies the Delaware Beneficial Use of Dredge Material Feasibility Study to permit the use of alternative borrow sources. This will significantly reduce the cost to nourish the Delaware Bay beaches. This section also includes a special rule that allows the Corps to provide emergency services to any of the Bay beaches included in the beneficial use study under the existing continuing authority. This, these inclusions will result in increased opportunities to work with the Corps that we on the Delaware shore have not enjoyed in the past. Once again, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak on this very critical issue. Uh, Mayor, thanks uh, for your leadership in Slaughter Beach, and thank you for your extending that leadership uh, well beyond Slaughter Beach and joining us today. Thanks so much. Next, uh, Derek, Derek Brockbank. Uh, Ms. Brockbank is the Executive Director of the Coastal States Organization, which represents our nation's coastal states, territories, and commonwealth. Prior to that, he served as the executive director for the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association and as campaign director for a coalition effort to restore the Mississippi River Delta and coastal Louisiana. Mr. Brockbank, uh, you are recognized for your statements. We're delighted that you have joined us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Carper, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Coastal States Organization. I am honored to be on a panel of what I consider absolute coastal champions uh, at multiple levels of government. <clears throat> Since 1970, uh, CSO has served as the collective voice for the nation's coastal states and territories on federal policy issues. CSO members are governor appointed delegates who run or oversee state coastal zone management programs. Our state members work closely with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to plan, permit, and implement projects in the coastal zone, serving variously as partner, client, and occasionally state watchdog of the Corps. And on behalf of our members, CSO has worked and continues to work with the Corps to develop and advance policies to better manage resources in the coastal zone. The topic of today's coastal hearing is of utmost importance to every coastal manager in the country. Coastal managers are facing unprecedented challenges uh, both caused and exacerbated by climate change, but perhaps the most acute climate change impacts uh, along the coast are in shoreline management and restoration. Along saltwater coasts, what we've heard a lot about today, rising seas and increasing storm intensity are expanding flood zones and will increasingly inundate low-lying coastal areas. But along freshwater Great Lakes coasts, lake levels are also fluctuating at unprecedented rates. 
This has led to increased pressure to restore or harden shorelines on both saltwater and freshwater coasts. Although many communities are now beginning to look at what we call managed retreat, the ability to move infrastructure away from the water's edge. But the reality is that both are needed. We cannot just restore or retreat, we need to restore and retreat. Determining when and how to restore and when and where to retreat is at the heart of coastal resilience. Fortunately, coastal communities and Congress have made significant strides to address coastal resilience. In particular, the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, together with funding and other recent supplemental appropriations, has provided states, the Corps, and other federal agencies an incredible opportunity to restore and improve the resilience of the nation's shorelines. In the past few WERDAs, Congress has enacted strong policies for the Corps on coastal resilience, and we've seen great improvement in the Corps' consideration of climate impacts. However, the Corps' willingness or ability to use natural infrastructure and focus on shoreline restoration across the country has not reached the level of importance it should given the magnitude of challenges from climate change. Therefore, CSO is very pleased to support the Shore Act, which significantly improves the Corps' ability to address coastal restoration and resilience by elevating shoreline and riverbank protection and restoration to a primary mission of the Corps. In many coastal regions, restoring a shoreline can serve many purposes in a community. Integrated beach, dune, and back bay wetland systems that use natural and nature-based features can help a community adapt to increasing flood risks, improve ecological value, and can provide economic stability. This balanced approach to shoreline restoration and management might not fit neatly into the, any of the Corps' current mission areas, but is essential to a functioning and resilient coast in an era of climate change. CSO believes making Shoreline restoration, a primary mission of the mission area of the Corps, will help develop these multi-use projects. Additionally, the Shore Act gives local project sponsors increased flexibility to account for climate change in the design and construction of coastal projects and changes project funding structures to support coastal communities with special consideration of economically disadvantaged communities. And while CSO strongly supports the Shore Act, we would encourage the committee to go to do even more to get the Corps to prepare coastal communities for climate effects climate impacts, including planning on longer time horizons and reforming the Corps' benefit cost ratio process. The Corps should recognize that although their projects, their coastal projects are often built for 50 year authorizations, local sponsors' expectations are that these projects last significantly longer than 50 years. However, given a rapidly changing climate, coastal projects are facing vastly different considerations than when they were when they were originally authorized. The Corps should plan and develop transition pathways for existing projects that are reaching their expiration and develop coastal adaptation projects for 50 to 200 year projections for sea level rise and, if possible, lake level change. Finally, uh, the current BCR analysis is keeping the Corps stuck in 20th century thinking. Thrilled to hear some of the progress that's being made, the testimony from Colonel Kelly about how that BCR is changing, but the reality of the of the coast is that it's multi-use. Resilient coastlines have ecological benefits, social cohesion benefits, public health benefits, even benefits of racial justice. The Corps should be developing and using a process to better quantify and incorporate the value of those benefits. And we know they are beginning to develop that process, but the sooner that can become used across the Corps, the better off our coastlines will be. Furthermore, the, Corps, uh, the current BCR uh, puts the Corps in a position of investing in areas of existing wealth. Congress has begun to direct the Corps to consider how to build resilient coastal infrastructure for economically disadvantaged communities, but this should go beyond pilot projects and reduce cost share for historically marginalized communities that have borne the brunt of poor coastal planning and decision making. The Corps needs to plan projects for a resilient and equitable future, not simply rebuild the coastlines of the past in ways that withstand climate impacts. However, reevaluating the core BCR must start with a long overdue implementation of the PRNG, as we heard from the previous panel. And until we see what the core is recommending to themselves for greater inclusion of benefits through the PRG, PRNG, it's hard to make specific recommendations for how Congress can direct the core. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to testify on behalf of CSO uh, before the committee on this critically important topic. Just to reiterate, Congress can make an important step by passing the Shore Act as part of WERDA 2022. Uh, we would also encourage the Congress to consider other studies and policies that would help direct the Corps to improve the nation's coastal resilience, to provide oversight and guidance to the Corps in improving the BCR, um, and ensuring that project decisions are based on forward-thinking values that consider our future climate and principles of equity and justice. We look forward to working with the committee, all of Congress, and the Army Corps on these and other important coastal issues.
Thank you uh, for the testimony. We look forward to continuing to work with you and the folks that, that, that you lead. I'm going to run and get a quick update on the Ukraine. I'll be back in just a few minutes. In the meantime, I leave you in very good hands, our Congresswoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all for your thoughtful and thorough testimonies. Uh, I also want to um, reiterate what uh, Mr. Brockbank said about uh, you being coastal champions. Uh, I think your testimonies really showed that. And uh, also thank you so much for the focus and inclusion on all communities across our country. Uh, my first question is for Governor Edwards. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. The Corps has multiple authorities that permit the agency to conduct community outreach and planning assistance that help communities better understand core projects and design their own. As the governor of a state with significant rural and coastal populations, as well as uh, major cities like New Orleans, how might the Corps provide better outreach to communities with diverse needs? And it leads right from your last uh, testimony. Thank you very much for the question, Representative Blunt Rochester. And I think Derek did an excellent job of summarizing how important this is. Um, because while we, we get attached to what we have and we want to maintain it, and that's very important, sometimes we have to go beyond what we've done in the past, especially in the area of equity. Um, because it wouldn't be an equitable problem had we done it right the, the first time. Uh, and so I think this this is really important. And, and what, what's going to have to happen, I, I believe, is and the SHORE Act helps to address this, uh, the Corps is going to have to get off, uh, not well, continue to do its primary missions, flood control, aquatic ecosystem restoration, and, and navigation. But we have to elevate to an equal priority, put on par the mission of coastal restoration and ecosystem restoration. And then within that framework, make sure that we're doing so much of what the Biden administration is talking about with respect to equity and it becomes a focus. And, and by the way, it can be hard to define and quantify, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not important and that we shouldn't try and that we can't do better. Uh, and so that overall framework, I think, should permeate what the core does every day. Uh, and then it should guide the allocation of resources, which even though we're going to be much more generous as a country with the core than we've ever been in the past, they will still be resource constrained. They won't be able to do everything uh, but at least they will have a focus and a mission that drives uh, more investment in these uh, in these communities uh, that have been suffering for so long. Thank you so much. And uh, as you mentioned, I mean, one of the core functions of this core act is to include that fourth mission for the core of restoration and protection of our coastlines as well as our riverbanks. And I think as you um, specifically kind of tying it back when we the reason why I think we have gotten the broad based support is because we are looking at these things that intersect with different populations. As the mayor mentioned, uh, Slaughter Beach for the core might seem like a very small population. And so it becomes disadvantaged in a way from maybe larger places. And so that's why this focus and looking at cost benefit an, uh, in a different way is really important for this moment. Um, Governor, I also wanted to ask, um, the town of Grand Isle and its barrier island were severely damaged by Hurricane Zeta in the fall of 2020, and then again um, by Hurricane Ida, less than one year later, as you mentioned. Supplemental funds were provided to help repair the federally authorized coastal storm risk management project there. Given that climate change process uh, poses a compounding threat to communities like Grand Isle, should the Corps be authorized to rebuild coastal storm risk management projects to a more resilient and sustainable level when addressing post-disaster repairs? Why or why not? I think I know the answer. <laughs> just, just asking. Yes, ma'am. For the record. Yes, ma'am. For the record, the, the answer is yes. They obviously need to be able to do that. It, it really gets back to the build back better. Uh, if we know that the storms that we are currently experiencing are, are absolutely obliterating what we have built before, uh, then continuing to rebuild to that standard is just foolish uh, because it's not going to provide protection. It's not a good use of, of, of the funding. Uh, and and I will tell you, I've been governor for a little over six years. I have made multiple trips to Grand Isle to look at those systems and to implore the court to do better and not just go back and redo what they've done. And I think they're thinking along these lines now uh, for the first time. 
and it's a great relief to the folks down in, in Grand Isle as well, but still a lot of work to, to be done there. Uh, and, and Ida just slammed Grand Isle. Uh, it, you know, we have, we have people who are in their 80s and they've, they've been through hurricanes forever. Uh, this is many of them, this is the first time they ever left uh, the island for a hurricane. And when they came back, they saw devastation that they had never uh, seen before. And so it's very important that we, that we improve uh, the protection system there and make that, that island more resilient. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Mayor Locke, thank you for your leadership. Um, in addition to the economic concerns, Slaughter Beach is home, as you talked about, to a diverse ecosystem featuring a uh, symbiotic relationship between one of the largest horseshoe populations in the world. Uh, which I understand from the vice mayor goes back before the dinosaurs. I mean, I, I, and people here are shaking their heads as well. And it relies on horseshoe crab eggs as, as a food source. How important is a healthy shoreline for the continued survival of the local horseshoe crab population and by extension, the threatened red knot um, and other migratory birds? Well, certainly, um Congresswoman, it, it is a critical component of uh, uh, health longevity and continued uh, sustainability of horseshoe crabs. Um, they lay their eggs on sandy beaches. Uh, if we were at uh, Slaughter Beach yesterday, we were able to see some of them on our beaches. These are clumsy, it's a clumsy species that crawls ashore. And no offense. <laughs> no, no, yeah, please don't. Um, slow moving, clumsy species, but they they would be a hardscape, a sandy beach is really what they need. So I, I try to um, say they they are critical to the health and wellness of human life. Pharmaceutical companies. I've read articles. They're trying to find a uh, something that would replace the blood of horse crabs mm -hmm. uh, and totally successful in doing it. Thank you so much. Uh, I also wanted to um, ask you last year, Slaughter Beach uh, completed a study designed to evaluate management options for the persistent accumulation of a mix of seaweed and marsh vegetation. Uh, caused in part by the sheltering effects of uh, nearby core uh, constructed jetties. And again, yesterday, I got a chance to see this on the tour, exactly how the impact of all the, the, the sand coming down, hitting the jetty, and what that would mean. And this debris is detrimental to the local horseshoe crab population. But we also know those jetty, all of this is important as well to our national security and our safety as well. Uh, so one of the solutions proposed by the authors of the study um, was to establish a pilot program for the beneficial use of the material in the construction and reinforcement of the dunes lining Slaughter Beach. Uh, since the completion of the study, what steps have been taken to manage the organic debris and what lessons have you learned throughout the entire process? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, we have been uh, in discussions with uh, Delaware Department of Environmental Control um, on this issue of habitat restoration for shoe crabs and the red knot and uh, the division. And ask for their support um, as we go forward to apply for grants to help us remove this to try to build up that's caused by the jetty. Again, we're, we're going to the state to look for a partnership and develop a partnership. Um, but in fact, it appears from the studies that this is caused by the deterioration of the jetty that was allowed to deteriorate in this uh, century. So to it's a multifaceted issue and multifaceted problems. Yes. We are looking, we're at the stage where we're looking at grants from the partnership with the Delaware to uh, to develop. 
help us Great. repair the damage. Great. I, I want to also highlight that part of what this hearing is also showing is, again, the partnerships and the need for the partnerships. Um, we actually have Sec Secretary Sean Garvin behind the governor, and I want to give him credit as well for the work that he is doing with communities as well. Um, my next question is for Mr. Brock, um, Brockbank. Uh, the federal government has sometimes struggled to provide coastal communities the assistance they need to address the effects of climate change. Fortunately, many coastal communities across the country have taken great strides to protect their shorelines uh, despite that lack of federal support. Absent support from the federal government, how are coastal communities addressing the impacts of climate change? And as a follow-up, what more could the federal government do to amplify these efforts? And, and I know you said you're, we're waiting to hear more from the core on some of the, the suggestions you could give us, but what are some of the lessons learned or the things that we should be amplifying from local communities? I was wondering if maybe our governors could hold up their climate action plans again, because I think that's probably the, <laughs> the best example of what the states are doing. I mean, the We're states... not saying anything that uh, Delaware's plan is bigger than Louisiana, but... Okay, okay. Just saying, Governor Carney again. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the planning efforts that are happening at states, I mean, uh, huge credit to both governors for pushing these, these through. But in Louisiana, they've been moving forward with a state coastal master plan for 20 years now, um, almost. And it's gone through multiple, uh, you know, Republican Democratic administrations has passed unanimously. So it's there's a tremendous amount of planning that's going on. Um, states are increasingly investing their own funding. But I think one of the, the real challenges is we've often seen that big project implementation. You can do sort of small living shorelines, good, you know, good beach projects, small, you know, small pocket beach projects. But those big projects have too often relied on disasters and the funding that comes after the disasters, whether it's the BP oil spill, whether it's a hurricane. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the state's been able to do this incredible planning work, but now we need to, Congress and the federal government needs to put um, put the pocketbook to the test and, and actually invest in these projects and actually invest ahead of time. It's been a tremendous uh, to see the infrastructure bill yeah. move forward, um, but that's a one-time down payment. There needs to be some consistent regular funding so that, that the governors and, and the core can actually plan their projects out, farther out. Excellent. And I'm going to uh, ask Mayor Locke, um, and it kind of dovetails into that question too, as, as was already mentioned, Delaware is the lowest lying state in the country and has, and I will say lowest mean, <laughs> look, I, I always have to add that mean in there so that Florida and Louisiana don't come back at us and say, no, we're lower, we're lower, but Delaware is, um, and has experienced sea level rise greater than eight inches along its coast since 1960. Uh, on top of that, increasingly frequent and intense severe weather events, and as you called them, Mayor Locke, uh, violent, violent coastal storms, um, including Hurricane Ida and the recent Nor'easter, continue to damage our coastline. Can you talk about um, again, how your community, how your your town uh, has dealt with sea level rise and climate change, how it's affected you, but also what kinds of things you're doing at a local level to mitigate. And I know it's a, it's micro and we've got macro. Again, an excellent question. Um, we have uh, at, at a local level, um, we've been frustrated a bit by um, what we as um, communication barriers between the partners that we're looking to uh, to provide guidance to protect against sea level rise. I'll be honest with you, the uh, this is way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to uh, take the question back? Please. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think, but again, this is a great dialogue. And, you know, we're fortunate that we actually do have a governor who has been a congressman, has been a governor, knows financial sector, and actually has a plan. And uh, Governor Carney, if you could just share um, what you think are some of the challenges and opportunities of this moment. Well, I think uh, Mr. Brock. Uh, ben has really hit the nail on the head, right? We, up until this point, uh, in my experience anyway, and we have folks behind me 
And by the way, when when I'm talking, I think Sean Garvin's lips are actually moving. <laughs> And he's got it's the mask. That's I, why he's I think he's got Tony Pratt sitting next to him who knows more about who's forgotten more about this than, than many of us uh, know. But so for so long, this these restoration projects have been based on a, a disaster driven, you know, kind of an approach. And that's how the way the money flows. And it's based on cost benefit ratios that don't consider some of the things that you and the mayor are talking about and that are important parts of the calculation, whether there are environmental damages, whether you're comparing a town like Slaughter Beach to a town like Lewis with Mayor Becker, they're very different to, in terms of size, uh, in terms of property values and all of that. So how do you, and I think the Shrek attempts to do this is to how do you have consider other factors in an analyzing a, a, a go or no go or limitations around what the core would participate in. There's a project, an inland project that comes to mind uh, in my experience uh, called Glenville. And you may remember the, the community of Glenville was, was flooded out completely by one of the uh, hurricanes probably 25 or more years ago. 1989, I think, was the first uh, the first big flood there, and it never quite made the cut with respect to the cost benefit analysis. wasn't a high income community, and ultimately, this step, in part under Governor Carper's leadership, took uh, took the bull by the horns and provided resources, frankly, to purchase the properties which were built in the floodplain in the first instance. And so, those kinds of projects, projects like uh, situations like what we saw and uh, we're seeing right here in Slaughter Beach. How do you factor those into a new way uh, of, of proceeding on funding for these projects through the core? The problem is it's going to cost more money, right? Because you're going to open up more, uh, more eligible projects and you're going to, I would assume, uh, qualify other things than what are currently qualified. The Shore Act is certainly uh, a really big step forward in, in that uh, in that approach. Thank you, and I yield back to the chairman. Thanks so much. I'd ask uh, my staff in Washington to give me an update at about just before we got to the end. Uh, so we're going to do a press availability. We'll see if, if there's anything new that, that, that we need to know about what's going on in the Ukraine, we'd be prepared to respond to questions. Not to be alarmed. There's uh, the situation is dire, serious but uh, nothing to be alarmed about further at this, at this moment. So, so rest easy. Um, I, I, this is the last couple of questions. And I, I'd like to uh, direct uh, my first question to our governor. And uh, uh, governor, uh, as you know, uh, Delaware's known for its uh, pristine five-star beaches. We've been talking about them uh, all, all day. Uh, and this is one of them. And a number of others are popular vacation spots for for uh, many people who live up and down the East Coast, actually people who live a long, a long ways from here and come here even outside the country. We know the coastal uh, communities are vital. The United States economy at large, but I'm curious to hear about their importance at the state level as well. And my question would, would you just take a moment and share with us uh, a little bit about the importance of Delaware's coastline to our state's economy at large? I'm thinking about quoting our president when he was vice president, but I won't, but it's a big deal. I remember it really that. is a big deal. We've talked about some of those numbers before. They're not numbers that approach the kind of numbers that Governor Edwards in a bigger state uh, like his. But for our state, you just look at the coast from here. We're almost at the southern border uh, here with Maryland, the Mason-Dixon line, all the way up the Atlantic uh, Ocean beaches. Uh, the tourism industry that includes this and, and tourism in other parts of our state is a multi-billion dollar industry. M much of it is here in eastern Sussex County. You're talking about the property values of, of all these homes and communities. And you're talking about smaller communities like Slaughter Beach and the property values there. If you do a calculation about the assessed value of properties that are located within areas projected to be inundated um, by a meter and a half of sea level rise, you're talking about over a billion dollars of, of, of that. So the, the impact uh, is critical. I think the question goes back to my answer to the last question, which is how do you factor in things other than economic value 
uh, to uh, to give a green light to, to core core funded projects and locally funded projects. Uh, so it's critically important, and I think we have to find, but we have to find ways to to factor in uh, criteria other than those economic benefits into the analysis. All right, thank you, um, uh, Governor. Uh, uh, Edwards, I, if you don't mind just responding briefly, same question. Uh, would you just share with us for a moment the importance of Louisiana's coastal area to your state's uh, economy? You know it's great. Yes, sir. And well, first of all, thank you very much for the question. We're, we're very proud of, of our entire state, but coastal Louisiana, uh, the, the, the coast isn't just important to our state's economy. I think it's incredibly important to the nation's economy. Right around 45% of our population, 4.6 million people live in coastal Louisiana, and as I mentioned before, there's tens of thousands of, of businesses there. Uh, we have the second highest landings in the nation of seafood, uh, but the best tasting. Uh, whether it's oysters or shrimp or crabs or fish, you name it. Um, five of the nation's top 15 ports uh, are in Louisiana, including the largest port by tonnage in the Western Hemisphere. 60% uh, of the nation's grain gets exported out of the Mississippi River. And, and we're deepening the river now, so that's soon going to be 70% of the nation's grain that gets exported will come through uh, Louisiana. 90% of all the support for oil and gas exploration and production in the Gulf of Mexico is based out of Louisiana. Um, and over half of the current LNG exports, which are increasingly important because of the Ukraine situation that you just mentioned, if we're going to help our, our friends in, in Europe. They come from Louisiana. That's all along the coast. And, and it's not this traditional oil and gas. Uh, the coast of Louisiana is going to be extremely important as we transition uh, to low carbon and no carbon alternatives, whether it's, it's, it's wind energy in the Gulf, uh, the solar farms that we're going to need to support the petrochemical industry, they're going to be located in coastal Louisiana too, because that's where the industry uh, is. Um, and, and so when it, when it comes to carbon capture and sequestration, that's going to largely happen uh, along the coast. Uh, hydrogen production is going to happen along the coast in Louisiana. Uh, and one thing that's really important, and, and I didn't realize this until we, we actually had our Climate Initiatives Task Force, and, and they educated me in so many ways, an acre of marsh will naturally sequester 80 times the carbon as an acre a forest, but we're losing that acreage. As we restore it, as we build it back, uh, we're actually gonna be sequestering more carbon. So for all of those reasons and many, many more, coastal Louisiana is extremely important for our economy, uh, but also to the nation's economy and to the nation's future. Thank you, sir. Let me ask a, a question I could, if I could, uh, governors and I guess, uh, the, uh, for everybody. And we'll just start, Derek, with you, if, if we could. Um, as I noted in my, uh, my opening statement, 40% of our nation's population, it's about 130 million people, live in our coastal counties. And if uh, coastal counties in our entire country were considered as a nation, we'd be uh, like number three in the world, right behind China and the US. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, accord does not uh, fully account for the protection of the, of the pop uh, this population, industry, and wealth when formulating coastal protection projects. Uh, nor does the the core account for the financial benefits of tourism and recreation that are often attached to these uh, projects. My question of each of you, and Derek, we'll start with you. Would would each member of, of our panel please share with us how the core might better capture the economic importance of coastal communities? when designing coastal protection projects. Thank you for the question. Uh, really at the heart of what this hearing is about, I think um, the economic uh, value of recreation is a clear one. Um, I think increasingly there's gonna be a need to look at uh, access. And I think I mentioned the racial and uh, racial justice, economic justice. I think considering how, um, how equitable the access to the coast is, is a exceedingly challenging uh, thing to put into monetary metrics, but I think ensuring that the coast is um, is the playground for America and not just the playground for the wealthy is is a, a challenging thing and something I think the core needs to think about. All right, thank you, Mayor.
Thank you, Senator. Um, I think that most analyses that are done with cost benefit ratios um, capture the cost of projecting solely uh, the potential losses against the potential cost. And that's how the, the ratio is derived. Um, to me, it's a very narrow approach. And um, actually, NOAA has become a leader in recommending and providing guidance to other federal agencies that the uh, cost benefit ratio should be modified and the approach to developing it should be modified to include ecosystems um, services. And, and that means the cost of, you know, if, if we're looking at, at just projecting losses, you know, include in that the cost of restoring wetlands, the cost of water, cost of job losses, the cost, I mean, there's, there's a, a world of things that could be considered when we're looking at cost benefit ratios. And again, I, I believe that what the core does is a very narrow interpretation should be expanded. Thank you. Um, Governor Carney, Governor Edwards, if you want to add anything, please. I would just uh, add some, some uh, environmental analyses as well as sustainability in addition to recreation and to the effect on uh, an equity, which is, is, is a hard thing to measure. But, you know, you talk about somebody who owns a, a house here worth over a million dollars and somebody lives in a, in a less affluent community, that house is the same protection for that family in, in each community, just valued considerably differently. And that, that doesn't factor in uh, as well. And I think this this climate change measure of sustainability and I think the, the reference to either um, shoreline restoration or managed retreat, like what should it be? What should the standard be? That's a little bit different than eligibility, but I think it really affects approach. Uh, Prime Hook's, I think, a good example of that. I mentioned uh, Glen, the Glenville project of years ago. Similarly, what, what's the sustainability of, of the solution and the design of the solution? Uh, Senator Carper, thank you for the question. Sure. Very quickly, um, I think all aspects of a coastal region's economic portfolio should be taken into consideration by the Corps in their cost-benefit analysis. As Mr. Brockbank mentioned, you know, our coastal areas should be playgrounds for all of America. And I would just talk about tourism. I talked about a lot of things in my previous uh, answer. Um, but tourism is hugely important to all coastal states, but particularly to ours. We're known as the sportsman's paradise. Uh, we are a tremendous draw for fishermen, for hunters, for bird watchers, other outdoor enthusiasts. Uh, the greater New Orleans area is a magnet for international tourism. Uh, next Tuesday is Mardi Gras. Uh, a few weeks after that, we will host the sixth NCAA Final Four in New Orleans. No other city's ever done that. Uh, and that's just some examples that come to mind right now. So all of that should be taken into consideration uh, by the Corps so that they can drive their decision making and their allocation of, of resources. And, and I think if they'll do that, then, then the, the importance of the, um, of the coastal regions of our country will be more fully uh, taken into consideration and drive those decisions. All right. Thank you. I have two more questions. One, uh, I'm going to address to um, Governor Carney and then uh, last question, if I could come back to you, Governor Edwards. And um, Governor, Governor Carney, um, with respect to um, storm damage uh, buildup, as, as you know better than almost anybody, the, the Corps can only provide emergency restoration uh, assistance to nourish a, a beach when that beach has been damaged uh, by a storm uh, of an other than ordinary nature. That's of an other than ordinary nature. Uh, that prevents adequate functioning of the beach. Parts of Delaware's coastline have been damaged by, as you know, by successive severe weather events, including hurricanes, including nor'easters, uh, and other tidal and storm events. Though the damage from each of these individual events may not rise to the level of other than ordinary nature, uh, collectively they have uh, dramatically eroded and damaged parts of our coastline. My question uh, is, if you take it together, how have the successive and compounding effects of severe weather events 
impact to Delaware's economy and the safety of the affected communities. So we've talked a little bit about this before in terms of a different approach than just a disaster driven uh, approach uh, where it's more of a management uh, situation where you've got a series of increasingly uh, less severe uh, events, storm events, but taken together, uh, they create really worse situations when you have the big event, if you will. And so uh, we've seen that here in Delaware this past fall and winter, a series of small storms uh, can be damaging as one big large storm, right? Ida in our state is a great example of that in the limit of its extent. If you think about the serious rain event happened over the line in Chester County, Pennsylvania along the Brandywine, but the effect was downstream in a very small minor poor minority community on the edge uh, of Wilmington. We've had a series of those kinds of events and increasingly we're, we're gonna see more of those. Again, in Lewis, uh, Mayor Becker, according to a 2000 a report, we could see between 50 and 135 high tide flooding events per year by 2050. In 2019, there were nine uh, such events. So the intensity and the frequency of the, these events is going to increase. And somehow, as we think about the future, we've got to start doing things differently than we've done them in the past because we have a new reality. And the new reality is climate change, it's sea rise in our state. Uh, we're gonna have to manage shoreline restoration. We're gonna have to manage retreat, to use Mr. Brock, Brock Bent's, uh Banks uh, terms. And factoring those into the work of the Corps, I think is gonna be really critical to our ability to deliver for the people of our state and the communities here. Thank you. Last question. Uh, again, uh, Governor Carney, sure. Uh, I think I may. Uh, Gov Governor Edwards, let's come back to Governor Edwards. Yeah, uh, a, a short question. Would you please describe your state's experience working with the Corps on the matter of implementing uh, coastal master plan projects to, uh, to mitigate the impacts of federally authorized projects. Would you please describe your state's experience working with the Corps on this uh, the matter of, of this uh, implementing the coastal master plan projects uh, and highlight any legal or policy barriers you can to implementation? Yes, sir, Th thank you very much. Uh, that, that too is a great question. First of all, we have a, a great partnership with the Corps of Engineers, and it's not perfect and, and so forth. Um, but this is one area that's incredibly important to us because we believe that when you analyze um, mitigation opportunities, or when the Corps does that, they should look to scientifically back plans for coastal restoration and protection like we have in Louisiana. Um, and the Corps shouldn't always choose the cheapest option uh, we would want them to look at the option that's going to provide the most beneficial impact, the, the biggest restoration benefit, if you will, especially if the non-federal sponsor is going to be paying for it, like the state of Louisiana. Um, now, the state and the Corps have been collaborating closely on the West Shore Lake uh, Pontchartrain Risk Reduction uh, Project, which, by the way, when it's built, it will protect the community that President Biden visited in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Ida. It's a predominantly African-American low-income uh, community, and it's gonna benefit tremendously uh, from this project. Uh, and But in that document, the Corps is gonna consider the Marpaw Swamp diversion that we are doing as mitigation uh, for the West Shore project. But we believe that internal policies currently existing in the Corps uh, may well create obstacles that prevent them from adopting this common sense approach. Uh, and by the way, that's why we, one of the reasons we so much appreciate the Shore Act, because you would be giving them direction uh, to do the things that we believe just, just make good uh, common sense. So I think that's an example of how uh, the, the Corps can do better, how the, the Shore Act will drive them to do better, 
and then we will get the full benefit of the projects that we are doing that have a, a positive impact on the federal investment by being able to use that credit uh, towards our, uh, our match obligations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. I uh, was checking the mail. We got uh, some mail in our house yesterday. I opened up. There was, we got something from Louisiana. And uh, it was a, a, a photo uh, and a card from the uh, from uh, uh, Senator uh, Bill Cassidy, who succeeded uh, uh, Mary Landry, who was a, a senator from Louisiana. It's a lo lovely picture of, of him and his wife and their, their three children. And on one side of it, the uh, um, there were some words in French, and uh, I don't recall exactly what the words were in French, but the the, the translations would let the good times roll. Yeah, Can you tell us what what. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> I don't know that we're ready to let the good times roll here as we face this challenge of climate change and sea level rise. But um, I, I do know this. Uh, ben Franklin, a uh, long time ago, uh, really nailed it in terms of advice for us today and for, for generations. Uh, he once said, um, uh, we came to this country in different boats, but we're in the same boat now, and our boat is in danger of sinking. And we really did come here in different boats, literally and figuratively. And uh, our uh, parts of our country are in danger of sinking. And the question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? And uh, one of the things we uh, we need to do, uh, go back to the seas. Uh, I like to say uh, seas for a vibrant marriage is the ability to communicate, to compromise, to collaborate. And those are three things that we're endeavoring to do. And we have to uh, endeavor even uh, more uh, energetically to communicate, to compromise, to collaborate. This is, uh, we've had a wonderful ongoing conversation with the Army Corps. Uh, we're uh, really grateful to the Army Corps for all they do for our state, not just for our economy, but for quality of life and the ability to, to live here, raise our families, and, and to welcome strangers from other places. But, um, this, uh, this uh, hearing was designed to put a spotlight on the challenges we face and to say, what everything I do, I know I can do better. Everything I, I do, I, I've always felt this way. And I suspect, if truth be known, we all feel that way. And how do we enable the, uh, the Armored Corps to, to do better their job, given the, the changes that we face on, on our coasts? How do we enable them to do a better job? How do we do this in, in a collaborative way? What are the roles of the states? What are the roles of the federal government, the, the Army Corps, uh, and us as, as citizens? It's um, not enough to empower the Army Corps. It's not enough just to change cost-benefit uh, analysis and the ability to, to work with those mechanisms. The, uh, it's also really important for us to address the root causes of why the seas are rising. That's really critical. If, if all we do is, is the things we've talked about here today, we're still going to be uh, in a world of hurt. 10 years from now, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we'll still be in a world of hurt. We've got to do both uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. And uh, I think here in Delaware and Louisiana, we're smart enough to do that. And uh, I believe Democrats, Republicans across the country, Congress and pre this president especially, uh, we're smart enough to do that. And it just takes the, the willpower and the willingness to, uh, to, to lead. Uh, the kind of uh, leadership that we've actually seen demonstrated by both of you uh, in the face of this pandemic, by the, the administration, by a lot of people, by National Guards, by all kinds of people during the course of, um, of this pandemic, that kind of leadership, we need that. Not just for a couple of months or a year or two, for decades, for decades. And if we do that uh, years from now, when uh, people come here to, uh, to Bethany Beach or other beaches in Delaware or up or down the coast, they, they may not know their French that well, but uh, they'll be in a position to, uh, to let the good times roll. And they'll uh, look back and say, well, bless those people who had a hand in, in this.
Let me see. I have some uh, uh, housekeeping. I just need to to go to go through the uh, with respect to uh, to follow up. But to, before I do that, uh, we uh, got. Let me just say this: we got a, a, on the record. We need to uh, continue to equip uh, this agency, the Army Corps, with the tools it needs to amplify to amply protect our nation's coast and make them more resilient to flooding, to erosion, extreme weather. And my hope uh, and prayer is that today's hearing will uh, better inform our work in these areas. And now I, I just want to ask a unanimous, because I love asking unanimous consent at a hearing when I'm the only one there. <laughs> and Because so, I could only object to my own request. But now Lisa is here. <laughs> but I'm going to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record reports and articles that relate to the impacts of climate change on our nation's shorelines and coastal communities. These documents stress the severity of the climate crisis and emphasize the new realities as a nation that we face as a nation in coming decades. Is there objection? Hearing none. Uh, additionally, uh, our senators and our colleagues will be allowed to submit questions to our, uh, our guests, our, our witnesses for the record through the close of business on March 9th. We will compile those questions We'll send them to our witnesses and ask our witnesses to reply, if you would, by March 23rd. And uh, with that, I just want to say uh, uh, John Kane is sitting here to my left. And John heads up our uh, water team on the uh, Committee on Environment and Public Works. He'll be largely uh, writing hold of the pen, if you will, as we write the uh, Water Resources Development Act, which will hopefully include the Shore Act. And he does uh, does a great, great, terrific energy. He's like a uh, bull in a china shop. but Every now and then you need a bull in a China shop. <laughs> and he plays that role and he's amazed with, here with him. We got uh, the other uh, the other members are of our water team on EPW. Just raise your hands. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all. And, uh, and and I'm gonna go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to also acknowledge Alexandra Gillen from our team in Washington. And we have other members like Andrew and Victoria in the back as well. But uh, Thank you so much, Senator and Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Kate Rohr was here earlier. I don't know if Kate is, is still. Kate works for Senator Coons. Senator Coons is, sends his best. He is a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and is in uh, Munich for Munich. They have a, an annual, uh, actually more frequent than annual um, security meetings in Munich. He's attending that on, on behalf, along with some of my colleagues, on behalf of our country. And um, I think I think, uh, I think that's it. It's been a good uh, two, two and a half hours. A long time, but uh, folks, there's not there's not much more uh, many challenges and issues that are more important than what we're talking about here today, and we've got I think a better idea of how to go forward and make uh, make sure that the good times continue to roll in the future. Thank you all, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>